All right, guys. Good evening. I'm Dr. Sandeep, your surgery faculty. Can you all hear me? Can you all see me? Good evening, guys. Good evening. All right. So uh, let's kickstart the session. Uh, this is going to be a sprint series. We'll be talking about high yield topics, important topics, all the crisp concepts. Uh, so I've divided the uh, whole session into two parts. That is day one and day two. Day one, we'll be talking about all the important theoretical concepts. Day two, we'll take up a notch up and we'll talk about the previous year questions. We'll emphasize on repeat. We'll talk about the techniques and we'll talk about how to score maximum in surgery, right? So brace yourself. Can we start? Now, before we go down, there's a quick review of the topics that you need to emphasize for exam. Remember, this is a competitive exam. It is not how much you know. It is how much you are able to reproduce on the day of examination, how much you are able to emulate and reciprocate. So let's keep it clear and crystal. All right. All right. So, so one of the most important sorted of topics for your neat exams is going to be trauma. Trauma will be emphasizing on the following important aspects. The head injury. We'll talk about the fast that is focus assessment with sonography and trauma. We'll talk about blood transfusions, shock, absolutely important pinpoint, important topics, splenic injury, solid organ traumas are an uptrend for you. The bladder and the urethral injury kidney. I mean, when you can add the renal traumas here, renal traumas are also an important aspect for this. Uh, when it comes down to thyroid, again, a very, very important topic. We'll be talking about graves. We'll talk about auto-inflammatory or inflammatory disorders, carcinomas, and the various cytology. That is very, very important from the pathological aspect as well, right? Uh, guys, don't worry which year you belong to. If you're attending a session, let's make it productive. And those who are ex preparing for exam, please focus down. Breast, again, an absolutely important topic uh, where you talk about it in the breast. We'll talk about important as abscess and cancer. Two important aspects. Hernias are important. HPB, liver is absolutely important. HCC, that is hepatocellular cancer, is a thumbs up for you. In GIT, very, very important in terms of colon cancers, motility disorders of esophagus, colon cancers, bowel obstructions, congenital disorders like Michael's diverticulum, IBDs, and rectal prolapse. Again, an important aspect to focus down. Bile duct, absolutely important. Gallbladder carcinoma, uptrend for you. Very, very repeat questions are coming. Cholangiocarcinomas, post cholecystectomy pain again. Bile duct injuries, post cholecystectomy pain management. All these are absolutely important. Sphincter of order dysfunction is another important topic that you need to look across here. Pancreas, yes, acute and chronic pancreatitis and periampillary carcinoma. A lot of important rules, a lot of important thumb aspects and clinical presentations are important. Transplant, another important one. Nutrition is picking up. Urology, you'll talk about RCCs, renal cell carcinomas, prostate cancers, vesicuretric reflux, bladder carcinomas, and genital urinary tuberculosis. Absolutely important list of topics. Plastic surgery, again an uptrend for you. Here we talk about skin graftings are still considered to be most important. Wounds, we talk about pressure sores, surgical site infections and frostbites. Important topics to be covered. Alright, so, so I'll be talking about the first and the foremost important topic that is going to be trauma. We'll see that what are the important aspects in a quick succession that we're going to keep across, right? Now, let's say you're working in a trauma bay. The ambulance rushes to your OPD or you can say in your casualty, the door opens and suddenly you see a patient. What is the first and the foremost important thing you're going to do? See, the most important resource that we have in the hospital is you as a doctor and I don't want those resources to be wasted. So I want you where you belong. I want where you actually are required. If I have a patient who requires your attention immediately, I should be able to get your attention down there. For that, we have to do triage. Right. I hope everybody knows triage is color coding. Now, previous exam question, they asked you triage is on the basis of what is the criteria of doing triage? The criteria of doing triage, is it on the basis of the severity? Is it on the basis of outcome? Remember, the most important is going to be on the basis of outcome. We'll talk about the basis of outcome that is going to determine and that is the most important aspect. Another important aspect according to the ATLS, right? 
according to ATLS, it is uh, the amount of supply that is available or the resources that are available, the resource that is available and if you are able to treat that particular injury, right? For example, you are working in a trauma where a patient comes with head injury and you don't have a CT facility, you don't have a neurosurgeon available, that patient cannot be kept here, right? For that important aspect, the triage. So triage, important two things. It is based upon the outcome. It is based upon the resources available and the injury treating capacity. Based on this, we have the following color coding. Now, the color code that we have is black, red, yellow and green. One color that I would never want to see on my patient during my practice is black because black means moribund or dead patient, right? What do you mean by red? Now, when you have a patient who is going to be having a red band, that is where I want you to rush. This is where you will use your maximum workforce. These are emergency patients. Yellow patients are the one who require an urgent attention if there is no emergency or the red patient green band when you put on a patient we call him the orphan child of casualty put a green band let him go you do your work come back and you can attend down so green patients they require delayed attention they do not have any life-threatening injuries in that context we are going to put across it so triage color coding is absolutely important from the exam perspective right now the two important aspects uh, when it comes down to trauma that we need to understand and work accordingly. One is when do you want to explore and when do you want not to explore in a patient of trauma. So we call it as the criteria for damage control surgery. DCS stands for, I hope everybody knows it. It is called as the damage control surgery and ETC stands for early total care. Right. So what is the criteria? So how do you decide? How do you decide that you are going to go with a damage control surgery or you're going to go with an early total care? Now, the first and the foremost in the damage control surgery or damage control surgery decision making can be remembered by a mnemonic that is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Everybody have learned it. What does A? A means acidosis, presence of acidosis. How do you know? We'll measure the pH. What should be the pH if it is less than 7.2? Again, it's a red flag, right? Now, blood pressure, absolutely important. But here, what is important? It is the systolic blood pressure. How much should be the systolic blood pressure? If it is less than 70 millimeters of mercury. If the patient is developing coagulopathy, decrease in temperature is hypothermia. So how much should be the temperature? If it falls less than 34 degrees Celsius of core body temperature. Elevated serum lactate, how much if it is more than 5 millimoles per liter? If it is more than 5 millimoles per liter, then this is a worrisome feature. Now, when you say fresh blood that is required for blood transfusion, and if the transfusion is achieving more than 15 units in the first 24 hours, or I can say if more than 15 units of blood transfusion is required, that again gives you a red flag. And if the injury severity score, ISS, if it is greater than 36, a number that you can never forget, right? Now, when you talk about the criteria for early total care, when do you decide that you want to stabilize the patient, right? A stable patient will get an early total care, unstable patient will be operated. So the mnemonic to be remembered here is going to be stable and that is going to be complete. C stands for complete. So completely stable patient. Now, early total care, that is support of inotropes. So that is if the patient requires or not requires. Remember, if there is no requirement of inotropic support, that means you don't need any additional heart pumping devices or the drugs that is required. That is going to be fine. When we talk about thermia, that is the core body temperature. If it is hypo, it is problem. If it is normal, it is no problem. When you talk about air, that means you should be able to breathe normal air. That indicates what? No hypoxemia. If there is no evidence of hypoxemia, again an important factor. When you talk about the blood pressure, if the patient is stable, hemodynamic stability, and if the serum lactate is less than 2 millimoles per liter, more than 5 is a red flag, less than 2 is good. When you talk about excretion, what are you talking about excretion? We'll always talk about urine output. How much should be the urine output if it is more than, if the urine output is more than 1 ml per kg per hour. If it is more than 1 ml 
per kg per hour that is an important and if the coagulation cascade or the profile that is coagulation profile is normal then you can say you can go with early total care right now so the criteria that we have summarized here for an damage control surgery and early total care it is the decision making right so this is an absolutely important topic from the exam point of view on what basis do you decide for damage control surgery and what basis do you go for etc now another important aspect when you talk about the damage control surgery no to understand damage control surgery it is done to prevent the lethal triad of trauma so what do you mean by the lethal triad of trauma what is the lethal triad of trauma now in i say triad there are three components the first important component is what it is going to be metabolic acidosis then it is going to be hypothermia then it is associated with coagulopathy now the whole objective of performing a damage control surgery it is to prevent the lethal triad of trauma as simple as that right so this is going to be an absolutely important topic again they have asked you what are the components of lethal triad of trauma again your previous exam question right now one of the most important aspects in terms of traumatic patients are shocks and usually they are the hemorrhagic shocks that are going to be daunting us right now based upon the amount of blood loss we have categorized the hemorrhagic shocks into four different classes that is class 1 class 2 class 3 and class 4 on what basis it is number one the percentage of blood loss if the percentage of blood loss is less than 15 percent we call it as class 1 15 to 30 percent of blood loss class 2 30 to 40 percent of blood loss class 3 and if it is more than 40 percent of blood loss if it is more than 40% of total volume of blood loss, it is considered to be a class 4 hemorrhagic shock. When it comes down to heart rate, remember in class 1, the heart rate remains normal, right? So there is no tachycardia, there is no require for compensation, the stream just flows across, it maintains. In class 2, it may remain normal or it might start to pick up to compensate. In class 3, there will be a definitive tachycardia. In class 4, there will be severe tachycardia. The blood pressure remains normal in class 1. It remains normal in class 2. In class 3, it may remain normal or decline. In class 4, it will definitely decline. When you talk about the pulse pressure, difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, it remains normal in class 1, decreases in class 2, further decreases in class 3, and significant decrease is seen in class 4 right respiratory rate remains normal in class 1 class 2 class 3 may remain normal or start to increase same as blood pressure but class 4 it will definitely pick up urine output remains normal in class 1 it remains normal in class 2 it will become oliguria in class 3 and anuria complete absence in class 4 gcs remains normal in the class 1 class 2 it starts to drop in class 3 as well as class 4 right requirement but blood transfusion is not required here it may or may not require it will require and here you require massive blood transfusion now the criteria for massive blood transfusion is if you are going with more than or equal to 10 units of blood is given within 24 hours of time now, if I only give packed RBCs, it will result in coagulopathy. To prevent that, I will be giving packed RBCs with fresh frozen plasma with platelets in a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. In a ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1. Now, remember a very, very important aspect. Whenever you're talking about platelets, you have multi-donor platelets and a single donor platelet. We talk about a multi-donor platelet which is also called as RDP that is a random donor platelet. SDP is your single donor platelets. Your multi-donor platelets will require six bags in comparison to one bag of SDP. So we say one SDP is equal to six bags of RDPs that is your random donor platelets. Right. So the original answer here has to be six is to six is to six. Because when you give 6 units of platelets, you have to give 6 units of FFP or 6 units of PRBC if it is an MDP, that is multi-donor platelet. 
but if it is going to be a single donor platelet then it has to be 6 is to 6 is to 1 and this is your famous exam question right so simple fact is 6 units of multi donor platelets is equal to 1 unit of single donor platelet as simple as that right so this is the chart that you have to remember now what is the carry home message two important things number one you should memorize the percentage of blood loss and number two emphasize on blood pressure the bp remains normal in class one class two the question is class three it may remain normal or decrease it is not necessary it will always decrease and that's a very very important phenomena to remember and these are your exam questions i hope i'm being clear and you know uh, pretty much on topic here another important aspect that you will see in terms of the trauma is your diffuse axonal injury now when we say what is diffuse axonal injury it is a complete disruption it is a complete disruption between the white and the gray matter here there will be a complete disruption between the white and the gray matters usually occurring in a decelerating injuries now in a diffuse axonal injury when the patient is presented to you the patient will be presented to you in coma the patient will be presented to you in coma and when you talk about the gcs obviously a coma patient will have a gcs of 3 by 15 any patient of head injury when he comes obviously with a lower gcs i will do an ncct head now post head injury if the gcs is low i would expect some amount of damage or some findings that you can see in ncct brain but here for my surprise ncct brain remains normal so a patient with post head injury present stay with coma where an ncct is normal i should immediately advise for an mri in an mri what will i see i will see presence of punctate hemorrhage I will see presence of punctate hemorrhage between the white matter and the gray matter. Now this punctate hemorrhage between the white matter and the gray matter is the characteristic feature or I can say is the telltale sign of diffuse axonal injury and this is associated with a very poor prognosis. This is associated with very poor prognosis, right? So I hope everybody has gotten through the concept of diffuse axonal injury and this was your previous INICT as well as NEET PG exam questions, right? Or previous exam questions or central exam questions, right? Now, another important aspect that you will see is about the Cushing striad in head injury, right? So what is the Cushing striad in a head injury and what does it tell you? Basically, it tells you that in a head injury, there's increase in intracranial pressure, right? Now, what is that we are talking about? Now, what is the component that we're talking about? In Cushing Strad, you will have a patient who is going to have hypertension. You're going to have bradycardia with irregular respiratory rate or respiration. So, there is hypertension with the decrease in heart rate that is bradycardia and irregular respiration now you might ask why is that so how is it happening now what happens is there is a concept right let's say whenever a patient has undergone a head injury right because of head injury there will be an intracranial hemorrhage right because of intracranial hemorrhage the intracranial pressure will increase to understand this we have a concept that is called as cerebral perfusion pressure cerebral perfusion pressure it is a pressure required to perfuse the brain how do you calculate that? That is calculated as mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure. Right? Now we say the normal CPP that you get, it is going to be 75 to 90 millimeters of mercury. Right? The normal intracranial pressure is going to be 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury. That is the basic objective. Now in order to perfuse the brain, the normal CPP is 75 to 90 before i further move down remember the minimum cerebral perfusion pressure required to perfuse the brain required to perfuse the brain if you can answer and respond the answer here is going to be a minimum of 60 millimeters of mercury whenever a cpp is less than 60 it won't be able to perfuse the brain and neurons are extremely sensitive to hypoxia and that will cause irreversible brain damage so body says i won't let this happen i'm a great fighter i'm not going to give it up same like you you're going to go for your exam 
without giving a no give up attitude the body says i also have a no give up attitude so whenever there is increase in intracranial pressure due to a head injury where there is hemorrhage the intracranial pressure is going to kick up whenever the intracranial pressure kicks up or the cerebral perfusion pressure will drop by simple math now the cerebral perfusion pressure drops so obviously the patient will not be able to get adequate perfusion and he'll die body says i won't let this happen how will you prevent so when we ask the body okay i understand dude the, you might die in a bit body says i'm not going to give up so easily i say what will you do body says i am going to increase my mean arterial pressure and i am like amazing right if you increase the mean arterial pressure your cpp increases so this decrease in cpp is nullified by increase in cpp due to mean arterial pressure now my question to the body is dude how will you increase mean arterial pressure it says yeah mean arterial pressure is a combination of two third of your systolic blood pressure and one third of your diastolic blood pressure all that i have to do in order to increase this by a simple logic i have to increase the systolic blood pressure i said great i said how will you increase now in order to increase the systolic blood pressure you have two options either you can increase the volume of the blood or you can decrease the size of the lumen or the blood vessel so the pressure increases right so either you have if, if you take this as a representation of a blood vessel in order to increase the pressure either i have to increase the volume of the blood right or i have to decrease the size or the diameter of the lumen so the lumen becomes smaller the pressure will increase either the volume has to be increased or the diameter that is vasoconstriction lumen should decrease so i said body what is the best way body say see if i decrease the size of the lumen obviously will increase the pressure but the volume going to the brain will not increase hence it will still remain hypoperfused i cannot take that risk i said great what will you do i said increase the volume i said how will you increase the volume where will you ask will you ask you know your friends to give some volume he says no 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 i have a beautiful idea i said what is that beautiful idea he says in order to increase the volume now we have to increase the volume means increase the cardiac output cardiac output is a measure of preload minus afterload i said yes he said what is preload and what is afterload you need to understand i said okay let me explain you that now preload is the amount of blood that is available in the left ventricle just before the contraction right and after load is the amount of blood that is left behind after the contraction right before contraction whatever is the amount of blood available in the left ventricle is preload and whatever amount of blood is left in the left ventricle after the contraction is after load if you minus that obviously you'll get the cardiac output so that means the blood that is gone out i said yes now the whole goal was to increase the cardiac output so in order to increase the cardiac output i have to increase the preload right if you increase the preload the cardiac output increases i said yes how do you increase it so what i will increase uh, in order to increase the preload i have to fill the left ventricle with more amount of blood now in order to fill the left ventricle the time taken to fill the ventricle has to be increased uh, and that is what we call it as the diastolic filling time it is the time taken by the left ventricle to fill i will increase if the diastolic filling time increases the volume of blood in the left ventricle will increase if the volume of blood in left ventricle will increase it will increase the preload if it increases the preload it increases the cardiac output i said amazing now how do you conquer this if you are increasing the diastolic filling time it is the time taken for the left ventricle to fill is increased obviously the rate at which the heart is going to contract per minute will decrease so the heart rate will fall now if the heart rate will fall it is what we call it as bradycardia and because the volume of blood is increased that is cardiac output is increased that means the amount of blood going from the left ventricle into the aorta is increased now if the volume of blood in the aorta increases the aortic pressure increases the aortic pressure is nothing but systolic blood pressure it is the pressure exerted by the volume of the blood onto the lateral walls of the vessel is what we call it as systolic blood pressure and the sdp or the systolic blood pressure increases causing hypertension now increase in intracranial pressure will cause stimulatory effect on the respiratory center which will cause an irregular respiratory rate you add all these three put together and this is what we call it as the pushing triad right so this is a very very important concept that you need to understand in terms of pushing triad per se right now another important aspect uh, uh, in the thoracic injuries is to understand about the deadly dozen concept right now these are the dozen that is numbered that 12 injuries in total that is going to occur in chest 
which are considered to be as the life threatening injuries or potentially life threatening i am going to divide them into two criteria one we are going to call it as immediately life threatening injuries another one is going to be potentially the life threatening injuries right immediately life threatening and potentially life threatening injuries right now when you talk about immediate life threatening injuries what are the injuries that we have in immediate life threatening injuries we have six right number one it is an acute airway obstruction tension pneumothorax pericardial tamponade open pneumothorax massive hemothorax tracheobronchial injuries all these are put together are what we call it as all these are put together is what we call it as immediate life threatening injuries these are called as the immediate life threatening injuries and these are your potential in potentially life threatening you have flail chest you have the aortic injuries the myocardial contusion the rupture of the diaphragm esophageal injuries and the pulmonary contusions right all these are considered to be as potentially life threatening injuries now one of the most important aspects is about the definition of flail chest right what is the definition of flail chest when more than or equal to two continuous ribs fracture at more than or equal to two different site on the same rib now this is your ATLS definition and this is what we are going to follow right this is what we are going to follow so remember again a very important exam question that is the deadly dozen immediately life threatening and potentially life threatening injuries right going to be absolutely important clear now another important topic that you'll come across in the exam is going to be with respect to the diaphragmatic injuries very 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 important right so the first is for all these are your previous exam questions i'm going to put it up in a in a summary form so that you'll be able to understand and we'll get through it right now when you talk about the diaphragmatic injuries what is the most common mode of injury so when you talk about mode of injuries in abdomen either it has to be blunt or penetrating injuries what is the most common mode of injury the answer is going to be it is the penetrating injuries it is going to be penetrating injuries right but if i say what is the most common organ to herniate in a diaphragmatic injury it is going to be the stomach it is going to be the stomach for obvious reasons which i am going to state right now when do you when do you have a large defect in a diaphragmatic injury it is associated with blunt trauma it is associated with blunt trauma right because in blunt trauma there's sudden increase in abdominal pressure and that pressure if it is you know substantiated enough it is going to burst open or it is going to perforate the diaphragm with a greater intensity and that will result in a very significant defect so the most common mode of injury is penetrating the most common organ to herniate is going to be stomach and the larger defect is associated with blunt trauma to the abdomen right now what is the most common site of the diaphragmatic injury is it the left or the right remember logically it cannot be right because it is guarded by liver so it has to be the left which is more common when compared to right now which among the following is associated with poor prognosis now is it going to be a penetrating injury or a blunt remember if it is secondary to blunt trauma as i told you the magnitude of the injury will be very severe defect will be large and the associated injuries are going to be very severe in these contexts right now remember there is no particular investigation of choice because it is very difficult to predict diaphragmatic injuries until and unless you don't evaluate it now in any blunt trauma to thorax as well as abdomen we will do a chest x-ray so chest x-ray becomes m i would say it becomes very valuable now sometimes if the defect is very small and there's no organ herniating you cannot even attempt or you cannot even get on a cross-sectional imaging that is ct or mri so the best way if i say what is the best investigation uh, then it has to be that is video assisted uh, either it has to be a diagnostic laparoscopy or it has to be vats so that is video assisted uh, thoracoscopy right so either it has to be vats or it has to be laparoscopy which is considered to be best but on a chest x-ray what are the findings that you're going to see 
But the first thing you will see that obviously there's a massive air bubble that is deposited here that indicate the stomach is being pushed into the thoracic cavity. Second, you see the heart is pushed onto the other end. There is features of dextrocardia. But what is more interesting is you see that this tube that is being presented here, it is a nasogastric tube, presence of nasogastric tube in the thoracic cavity in a confined air bubble is a very high suspicion for your diaphragmatic injuries and that is where you're going to make your diagnosis of diaphragmatic injuries. So when I say the best investigation, I've already answered, it is going to be the LAP or the VATS. In terms of management, if you've done a LAP or if you've done a VATS, you'll see the defect. So the management is simple. It has to be bring back the content. Bring back the content, that is reduce the herniated content and repair the defect and repair the defect right that is what the current recommendation is right so moving on further <clears throat> i've already discussed the lethal triad of trauma so we understood what is lethal triad of trauma is now uh what are the stages of damage control surgery again a very very important aspect Please do not get confused in phases and stages. Okay? So when talk about the stages, stage one is going to be patient selection. I've already told you the criteria who we are going to take it for damage control surgery and who is going to be taken for early total care. Stage two is considered to be as primary exploration. So those patients who require damage control surgery. Now, if you remember, I told you damage control surgery's objective is very clear. We are doing damage control surgery to prevent lethal triad of trauma right now in lethal triad of trauma i have to prevent metabolic acidosis i have to prevent hypothermia i have to prevent coagulopathy so i have to act fast right so in a primary exploration what is your goal or what are your objectives number one it is to control hemorrhage any ongoing hemorrhage has to be controlled and prevent any further contamination my goal is not to rectify the defect or the problem. If there's an active bleed, stop it. If there is any collection that can cause further problem, that is prevent any further contamination, there's a associated bowel injury, do a primary suturing of the bowel injury, put a drain and come out. I'm not going to repair it then and there itself. Now, stage three is the most important. It is what we call it as ICU care. What is the objective or goal of the ICU care? It is basically to correct coagulopathy. Now here we will give blood transfusions, we'll give FFPs, we'll give platelets to correct the coagulopathy. And this is going to last for 24 to 48 hours. Now one of the famous question is in a primary exploration, you have opened up the abdomen, would you close it? Remember in primary exploration, either you can leave the incision open by covering it with a fecal or I can say the Bogota bag, or you can do a temporary abdominal closure. Here, I'm not going to suture it completely. I am going to put stay sutures to close it. So here we'll have temporary abdominal closure. Here, we are going to have a temporary abdominal closure. Now, what is stage four? In stage four, once you stabilize it, I will take for the secondary exploration. Now in a secondary exploration, this is also termed as definitive surgery. This is also termed as the definitive surgery. And in definitive surgery, I am going to correct the anatomy. I am going to correct the anatomy and make sure that it is rectified. And stage five is a definitive abdominal closure. It is a definitive abdominal closure, right? So patient selection stage one, primary exploration is stage two, stage three is ICU care, stage four is secondary exploration and stage five is a definitive abdominal closure, right? Now this is how you will know that you have dealt, right? This is how you will know that you have dealt appropriately, right? Uh, guys, somebody is asking, is it recorded? I am pretty much live here. I'm very much live. Uh, so if you have any any uh, 
coefficient questions anything that you want to fire up i'm 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 right in front of you uh we will try to kick up as much as possible okay don't worry it's a live session guys now another important aspect in trauma is to uh, look in terms of the organ injury especially in blunt abdominal trauma we call it as fast and that is a focus assessment with sonography for trauma again an important aspect to look across now we have a 4p evaluation we call it as what is 4p it is the perihepatic space the perihepatic space you have the pericardial space that you have to see then you have to look across in the peri splenic space and obviously the most dependent cavity of the abdomen that is pelvis for the 4p evaluation i'm going to run my ultrasound all across here now we have an, a new uh, i would say uh, it's not new actually it's been there for a while now we say that it is going to be in terms of e fast right now in terms of e fast e stands for extended fast right so when we say extended fast what are you going to add what are you going to extend here now basically when you talk about the fast per se in the fast we spoke about only the four components or the four sites in the abdomen here i am going to divide the thorax into right and left the abdomen into four quadrants right i'll take the umbilicus here and then we'll look across here so we call it as the six site assessment so here i will be talking about the right thorax the left thorax uh, we have the right upper abdomen you have the left upper abdomen the right lower abdomen and the left lower abdomen all together you are assessing at six different sites and this is what we call it as extended fast now the question is what is the minimum amount of fluid required for an ultrasound to pick up in fast positive it should be a minimum of 100 cc sensitivity of an ultrasound of a collection less than 100 cc is less so if it is more than 100 cc yes then it is going to be significant it can be picked up easily on ultrasound now whenever there is a fluid collection that indicates it is associated with injury either it's a vascular leak or it could be associated with a bile leak on the liver side as well right now uh any patient who is stable but there are features suggestive of peritonitis you have to take up the patient for laparotomy right again the question cannot be asked in such a way because a peritonitis patient cannot be stable yes hemodynamically he can but he will deteriorate if it is a proven peritonitis if you are let's say you have taken a patient after an injury uh, after a trauma and then you see an chest x ray air under diaphragm that's on right side free gas under diaphragm it is an indication for exploratory laparotomy right it is going to be 100 uh, see guys 150 and 200 are on obsolete data atls is minimum is 100 yes in an inexperienced radiologist or the trauma surgeon because we don't use ultrasound on that basis for us it should be a minimum 200 because we are not that good in picking up volumes but a single best answer is going to be 100 and absolutely on point we'll talk about as single best answer as 100 cc right now This is a very famous question that was asked in one of your central exams, and they gave you this as a ultrasound image. Now you need to understand how do you differentiate between a normal lung and a pneumothorax, right? I hope everybody knows in terms of pneumothorax. If I give you a pictorial representation, we have two varieties of pneumothorax. We have the open pneumothorax and the tension pneumothorax. So you take this as the representation of the lungs. this is where you have the cardiac notch you have the uh, the heart being present across here uh, i would say uh, let's say this happens to be the pleura that is present uh, which is covering the lungs across here obviously you have the mediastinal pleura which is going to be continuous i'm just avoiding the uh, heart here this is going to be the trachea uh, the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus this is the tracheal presentation that you have now one that have drawn in green is what we called as a visceral pleura and one that is present on the uh, the extensive part on the ribs uh, this is what we called as parietal pleura in general between the visceral and the parietal pleura you will have uh, those who are not able to comprehend this is what we called as the visceral pleura this is your parietal pleura there's some amount of liquid to avoid any friction rub that you have uh guys diagnostic peritoneal lavage is done when you have a patient who is stable there is no significant finding on an ultrasound 
but if there's a high suspicion of patient having any intra-abdominal trauma, then you can do DPL. But again, it's not being very prudent. We don't use it very often nowadays. So DPL is out of the picture these days, right? Now, uh, when you talk about tension pneumothorax, the concept is very simple. Due to any reason, if, let's say there's a blunt trauma and there's sudden increase in pressure, if there is a rupture of the lung parenchyma, right? It's a traumatic injury, sudden increase in pressure, the lung burst open. Now, as the lung is going to burst open, obviously, then the parenchyma is going to breach across. The pleural breach will also occur. Every time the patient is going to breathe, the air that goes into the trachea, from there into the bronchus, will go into the lungs. From there, it will leak and the air will start getting collected between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. So, in the tension pneumothorax, right? So, this is the concept of the tension pneumothorax where you can see the air is leaking within the lung cavity from the lung parenchyma into the pleural space and not allowing the lung to expand because as more and more air is going to accumulate it is going to compress the lung it won't allow the lung to expand on the other hand when you talk about open pneumothorax which is more common i would say in a penetrating injury somebody took a knife you know just wanted to play with you and you poked it when it pokes it creates a wound here now when it creates a wound, this is how the thoracic cavity is opened. Obviously, there is breach in the parietal pleura. We all know thorax consists of what? It consists of negative pressure. Now because of negative pressure, it is going to draw the air from the external environment and the air is going to be kicked in. Now as the air goes in, it is going to get collected between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Now as the air is getting accumulated, it is going to compress the lungs. It won't allow the lungs to expand. Now, as it is not allowing the lungs to expand, again, it is pneumothorax, but this time it is coming from outside. We call it as open pneumothorax. Remember, tension pneumothorax, both of them are equally dangerous. When we context, when you talk about it, I would say it is the tension pneumothorax, which is far more dangerous when compared to open pneumothorax, right? Now, in terms of, you know, uh, as we speak across here, normally, you know, whenever the patient is able to breathe, like you and me, when you're breathing, our lungs are going to expand. They're going to, you know, compress a bit. They're going to expand back again. And that movement of the lungs can be seen on an ultrasound. And that free movement is what we call it as seashore sign. As if the waves are coming, they're going back. The waves are coming, they're going back. That is the lung is moving towards the parietal pleura, then coming back again to the pleura. So this movement, if it is present, presence of seashore sign is considered to be normal. But if there is a massive air, if it is completely filled with air, it is not allowing the lungs to expand. The lungs won't move. When they are not moving, there is no waves that are coming. So absence of seashore sign. Absence of seashore sign absence of a seashore sign or when there is no movement it will have a uniform texture and that is no motion or when there is no movement it will present to you as a barcode sign or also called a stratosphere sign a very very important aspect right so when you see a barcode sign like a stratosphere sign or also called as absence of seashore sign is what we call it as a pneumothorax right again a very very important aspect that you need to look across here so presence of seashore sign, this is where you will make mistake. Presence of seashore sign is normal. Absence of seashore sign is what we have to suspect, pneumothorax, right? Absolutely important. Now, again, a very, very important aspect that you will come across in the abdominal traumas is the splenic trauma, right? Now, in terms of splenic trauma, what is the most common organ injury in the abdominal trauma? There is a small update which is here. Overall, if they say overall, the answer is liver when compared to spleen. This is a new upper date. Initially, we used to say spleen. But remember the latest update which is on the 28th edition. 28th edition of Bailey that comes out to be as the liver right the most common organ injury in blunt trauma abdomen as of today blunt trauma abdomen is still going to be spleen now when we say abdominal trauma it includes both blunt as well as penetrating injuries because when you talk about penetrating the most common organ injury is going to be liver right overall most common is liver blunt it is spleen penetrating it is going to be liver 
the most common organ injury in a seat belt is going to be your mesenteric tear it is going to be mesenteric tear the most common organ injury in a blast injury right now in a blast injury you need to understand if you are talking about an air blast or are we talking about a water blast if you are talking about air blast remember if they are asking what is the most common organ injury in air blast then it is tympanic membrane right but if the question is what is the most severe which is the most severely damaged organ most common is this whereas if they say which is the most severe organ damage the most severe organ damage where you have maximum amount of air is going to be lungs right in terms of water you have to ask a patient was the head inside the water or outside the water so we call it as the head out and if the head is submerged that is head in if the head is out then it is small intestine if the head is in then it is tympanic right very very important so these are your important exam questions you know repeatedly asked so i'm just uh, giving you a quick recap for that now we talk about the grades of splenic injury again they are going to be absolutely important now when you talk about it we talk about the grading of splenic injury on two criteria number one the status of hematoma number two the depth of laceration now when you take this as the representation of the spleen right and we say this is the capsule that is present inside or around the spleen that is present when we talk about hematomas we are talking about subcapsular hematomas not intraparenchymal hematomas that is the most important concept that we need to build in splenic injuries we talk about subcapsular hematoma we are not talking about intraparenchymal we are not talking about bleed here right we are talking about subcapsular hematomas that is going to be an important aspect to remember now in grade 1 uh, what, what percentage of hematoma with respect to surface area if it is occupying less than 10% of total surface area in a subcapsular region it is considered to be grade 1 and the depth of the laceration less than 1 cm right so we talk about the depth of the laceration we're talking about when the spleen is going to be ruptured it will have a laceration we are measuring this depth if it is less than 1 cm we are talking about grade 1 in grade 2 the hematoma will be between 10 to 50% of the total surface area and the laceration would be between anywhere 1 to 3 cm in depth grade 3 you will have more than 50% of the space occupied and more than 3 cm in depth grade 4 is very important it is associated with intraparenchymal hemorrhage there is an intraparenchymal hemorrhage it is associated with a intraparenchymal hemorrhage associated with hilar injury it is associated with hilar injury right very very important right now grade 5 that we have we call it as completely broken spleen into small small pieces sir we call it as completely shattered spleen it is the completely shattered spleen the spleen is broken down into small small pieces right so these are the five grades now here is the point remember grade 1 grade 2 no matter what if the patient is hemodynamically stable we have to take the patient with conservative management in the conservative management we'll talk about giving fluids hemodynamic stability required if we'll go for blood transfusion and adequate analgesia grade 3 we will see whether the patient is stable or whether the patient is unstable right if the patient is stable i will take the patient for conservative management if unstable then i will perform an angiography to see if there is any active leak i will attempt an angioembolization to see if i can save the spleen if angioembolization fails 
then I will perform something called as spleen preserving surgery. And this spleen preserving surgery is what we call it as splenography. We'll go with splenography. Whereas grade 4, grade 5, we have to take it for splenectomy, right? So the grade wise management is again an important exam question. So I hope so they are across. Take it. Now, when you talk about splenectomy vaccination, very, very important. We're talking about this vaccination in an emergency setup, right? So post negative vaccination in an emergency, right? Now, what vaccine would I give an immediate post-operative period? In an immediate post-operative status and in a two weeks period time, in two weeks post-operative. Right, so when you talk about in immediate post-operative period, which vaccination would you give? Most important. I am going to give pneumococcal. Now in the pneumococcal vaccine, I will see if the presenting age of the patient is less than two years or more than two years. If he is less than two years, then we will give uh, that is the P7 valent or the PPV7 valent, right? Whereas if it is more than two, we'll give PPV23. That is 23 valent is what we are going to push across. P7, if the age is less than 24 months or two years, or if it is more than two years, we got PV23, right? Now, when we talk about in a two weeks post-operative status, we will give vaccine that is meningococcal as well as H influenza B, as well as H influenza B, right? Now, most common penetrating trauma of intestines is going to be small bowel. In small bowel, the answer is going to be jejunum. It's the jejunal injuries which are associated with penetrating. Somebody is asking, uh, which is the most common bowel injury in a penetrating trauma? That is going to be jejunum. Right? So, this is with respect to post splenectomy vaccinations. Right? Again, important from the exam point of view. Clear? I hope everybody is right on straight. Uh, so far, any questions, guys? Anything that you want to ask? Uh, Somebody is asking difference between an ICD and a needle thoracocentesis. Uh, see, uh, when you talk about the needle thoracocentesis, I'm just going to insert a wide bore needle in the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. But when you talk about ICD, I'm going to put a 28 French tube and I'm going to leave it there. Uh, in terms of uh, when you somebody is saying Anand Verma sir uh, Privat 1300 two years okay uh, sir overall most common abdominal penetrating trauma overall most common abdominal injury in terms of penetrating trauma is liver right but if you are talking about most common bowel injury in a penetrating trauma that is jejunum so you have to be clear on that right uh, somebody is asking in terms of ICD placement, I'll tell you that also. If you take this as the lateral aspect of the thorax, sir, we'll take this as the anterior axillary line. You take this as the posterior axillary line. And for the reference, we'll take this as the mid axillary line, right? Now we'll say these are the ribs. Let's say this is the fifth rib. This happens to be the sixth rib, right? This is the fifth rib. This is going to be the sixth rib. This is the anterior side. This is the posterior side. Needless to tell you, you have a muscle that is present here on the anterior aspect. This is your pectoralis major. Posterior, you have another muscle that is present. That is going to be your latissimus dorsi, right? So this is your pectoralis major muscle, and this happens to be the latissimus dorsi muscle, right? So when you look across here. In terms of one second, right now, you see, this is one muscle. Uh, this muscle is your pectoralis major muscle, 
this is going to be your pectoralis major muscle and this happens to be your latissimus dorsi muscle this happens to be the latissimus dorsi muscle now if you see very carefully there's a triangular area that is formed between these two muscles and the sixth rib and right here this is your icd placement this is where you put an intercostal drain and this triangle that we have made it is what we call it as the safety triangle this is what we call it as safety triangle okay okay so in terms of this you need to remember very very clearly that when you talk about the anterior border of the safety triangle it is going to be the pectoralis major uh, inferior boundary is going to be the superior border of the sixth rib and the posterior border boundary is going to be formed by latissimus dorsi right in the mid axillary line you will put your icd what is the icd used in adult it is going to be 28 french as simple as that clear sure so this is the placement for icds right so far any questions in trauma we're just almost summarizing it i'll just quickly go through it uh, another important is the uh, Glasgow coma score in terms of head injury. We call classify into minor, mild, moderate and severe. Minor GCS should be 15 with no loss of consciousness but there is head injury. Patient complains about it. Mild GCS of 15 or even for 14 if there is associated with loss of consciousness. 9 to 13 is moderate. Less than or equal to 8 is what we call it as severe head injury. And this is also an indication. This is an indication for prophylactic. This is an indication for prophylactic intubation. This is an indication for prophylactic intubation. Right? Again, an important aspect. For a gunshot wound in the abdomen, the most common organ injury is going to be small bowel. True. Okay. Uh, Limo, you are correct. You are talking about thoracocentesis. That is needle thoracocentesis in emergency for attention pneumothorax. If it is a child, it is going to be second intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. For rest, everybody, it is the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. That is what you have to remember. Right. So, we are not going to goof up with that. Now, in terms of the NICE guidelines, what are the indications of CT within one hour? And what are the indications of CT within eight hours, right? There are two criteria that you have to follow. Within one hour, GCS less than 13 at any point, GCS less than 15 at two hour point, presence of focal neurological deficit. If you are suspecting there is an open depressed skull fracture, if there is more than equal to one episode of vomiting and post-traumatic seizure, if any one is present, I am going to go with CT within one hour. On the other hand, when would you decide for CT within 8 hours if a head injury patient comes? Number 1, age more than 65. Anything can happen with these guys. Be vigilant. If the patient already has an coagulopathy, if he's on aspirin, if he's, is, if he's a, a patient who is on echosprin, right? The aspirin and echosprin, same, right? When talking about chronic heart diseases, right? Or coronary artery disease, right? Uh, dangerous mechanisms of injury, fall from a significant high road traffic, high, high velocity traumas, all that are important retrograde amnesia for more than 30 minutes if a patient comes with a person who is brought to him in casualty and then you look at that patient and ask who is that person and if that person happens to be wife and he fails to recognize that is where you need to understand there is a problem there could be two reasons either he is wantedly refusing to remember her and acknowledge or there could be amnesia which is so significant that he forgot the person who is most important right i would say in the other sense as well Right? So this is in terms of retrograde amnesia. Now, what are the key parameters to be maintained in a patient who has been in a neuro ICU post-traumatic injuries? Three important, you don't need to remember all the data, three important things. Uh, what should be the mean arterial pressure? What should be the intracranial pressure? And what should be the CPP? I told you minimum pressure required to perfuse the brain. That is CPP should be more than 60 that we have maintained here. Intracranial pressure is 5 to 50 normal. It should not become more than 20. Mean arterial pressure should be maintained between 80 to 90. So that systolic blood pressure should be more in order to get blood to the brain. Absolutely important. Is that clear? Okay. So these are the key parameters that you have to remember in terms of head injury per se. Now. Uh, another important aspect that you have is about the trauma scoring systems. Uh, there are various trauma scoring systems that we have. 
Uh, number one, we have the GCS scoring system that is Glasgow score, scale score. We have the components, sorry, we're talking about the trauma scoring systems as RTS, that is a revised trauma score. The components of RTS is your Glasgow coma score, systolic blood pressure, respiratory rate. You have to see a total score. Again, the scoring is not important, only the components of score is important. I'm just giving you so that you'll be able to remember for a longer duration of time. On the other hand, another scoring system that we have is called as MESS, which is called as a mangled extremity scoring system. According to the MESS component, you have the following components, right? Now, what are the criteria? Number one, the characteristics of the trauma, how it has occurred. Is it a low energy? Is it a medium energy or a high energy or a massive crush injury? Now, the status of shock. It is a limb ischemic status and the age of presentation. Again, the components of MESS are important, right? So these are in terms of trauma scoring systems. We have the RTS scoring system and MESS, that is a mangled extremity scoring system. Easy way to remember the MESS component. It is the energy with which the trauma or injury has occurred. Status of limb ischemia. Status of shock and the age of presentation. These are the components of the trauma score right okay now in terms of retroperitoneal hematomas uh, which are again seen post-traumatic injuries you need to understand the zones of the retroperitoneal injuries right so i've divided them into three different zones as you can see there is zone one there is zone two and there is zone three the zone one is what we call it as the central zone the zone 2 is what we call it as the lateral zone. It is what we call it as the lateral zone and zone 3. It is the pelvic zone or the most dependent zone that is present. Now here is the carry message for us. If there is hematoma in zone 1. If there is presence of hematoma. If there is hematoma in zone 1 the criteria for management the criteria for management that you should always explore management is going to be always explore irrespective of the content if there is hematoma if there is presence of hematoma in zone 2 or zone 3 so on an image or on a CT, we found there is an hematoma in zone 2 and zone 3. We have to see whether this hematoma is a pulsatile hematoma. If it is a pulsatile hematoma or if it is an expanding hematoma. If it is a pulsatile hematoma or an expanding hematoma, this is where I need to intervene and this is an indication to explore. Now, if there is a non-pulsatile or a non-expanding hematomas in a retroperitoneal hematomas, you don't need to intervene or do anything per se, right? Chalo. Clear guys? So this is in terms of retroperitoneal hemorrhage, right? So this summarizes uh, a very, very important aspect in trauma. So if you have any questions, right? If you have any questions, if you want to have any concepts that you want to clear up in trauma, you have another 30 seconds for you. Clear? Can we move on? Okay, so, so let's venture into the uncharted territories of head and neck, right? I'll start with thyroid. Clear? Now, again, very, very important topic. You can argue with me, sir, this came in medicine. This was a patho question. This was a pharma question. This was a surgery question. At the end, it's a thyroid question. Okay? And we own thyroid, right? We have the right. We call dibs on thyroid. So thyroid is ours, right? Uh, okay. Chalo. So, when you talk about the goitus, uh, I hope everybody knows when we say the word toxic, that means hyperthyroid, the word goiter means generalized enlargement of the thyroid gland. Now, when you talk about the 
toxic swellings of uh, toxic goiters we have the diffuse toxic goiter toxic multinodal goiter and toxic adenoma right also called as the primary thyrotoxicosis that is your diffuse toxic goiter secondary thyrotoxicosis a toxic multinodal goiter autonomous adenoma is your toxic adenoma this we call it as autonomous because this is independent this is independent of tsh it does not obey tsh it does not listen to tsh it says tsh do whatever you want to right i am not going to be bound with you guys a uh, pdf will be provided to you right the word toxic means hyperthyroid the word toxic basically means the word toxic means hyperthyroid this basically means hyperthyroid clear so now let's uh, quickly look at the comparative data between all of these we'll talk about uh, the diffuse toxic goiter the toxic multinodal goiter and the toxic adenoma now when we talk about the diffuse toxic goiter also called as the primary thyrotoxicosis the best example for this is going to be graves disease so you have to put graves disease in your head and you think about it here it is going to be the plumbers disease and here as i told you it is going to be an autonomous this is going to be an autonomous adenoma now we all know that graves is an autoimmune disorder right when we say pathophysiology it is considered to be as an autoimmune disorder plumbers is a complication it is a complication of multi nodular goiter this we don't know it is idiopathic i could say one fine day thyroid gland was setting it decided to do you know thing by itself no? not listen to tsh it formed an autonomous adenoma it started releasing the hormone right now when we say autoimmune majority of the autoimmune disorders are seen at a younger age of onset the usual age of onset here is between 20 to 30 years uh, your toxic multinodal goiter is seen between 40 to 50 years toxic adenoma is rebel and you become rebel when you start earning that is between 30 to 50 years right now when you talk about the presentation of symptoms or the sequelae of symptoms now very 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 important right so when you talk about the presentation how do you differentiate between primary and secondary thyrotoxicosis remember if there are signs and symptoms of toxicosis that arise first and then it is followed by thyroid swelling then if it is followed by thyroid swelling this is what we call it as primary thyrotoxicosis on the other hand when you have a secondary thyrotoxicosis if patient already have a pre existing thyroid swelling if there is already a pre existing thyroid swelling and this is now followed by signs and symptoms of toxicosis signs and symptoms of toxicosis this is what we call it as the toxic multinodal goiter or secondary thyrotoxicosis on the other hand if the signs and symptoms of toxicosis are seen along with thyroid swelling so here the thyroid swelling that is the swelling and the symptoms of toxicosis the thyroid swelling and the symptoms of toxicosis and the symptoms of toxicosis if they arrive simultaneously right if they arrive simultaneously we will call it as the toxic adenoma right now we talk about the skin over the swelling or in terms of surface right if i say in terms of this uh remember graves will have a warm skin because it is hypervascular it becomes warm the surface remains smooth here the surface is nodular but here the nodules are multiple toxic adenoma it will be a solitary nodule that you will be able to palpate the most common system involved here is cns here it is cvs here there is nothing specific we can say non applicable right now now when you say 
Graves is an autoimmune disorder. Autoimmune disorder will be associated with the antibodies, right? So the antibodies that are formed in Graves disease, this is what we call it as long acting thyroid stimulating antibodies, right? It is called as LATS, long acting thyroid stimulating antibody. Now this long acting thyroid stimulating antibodies or LATS antibodies, uh, what they do is they go down to the thyroid follicle, right? On the surface of the thyroid follicle, on the surface of the thyroid follicle, you have this TSH receptor. Now this TSH receptor See, we all understand the concept of receptor and the obviously the hormone that is going to come. They have a very uniform bond, right? And they are they are like lock and key. <coughs> Extremely sorry, guys. Right now, these antibodies which are formed, no. Initially, when they go down to this receptor, the receptor says, "You are not my key. Get lost." So this goes and it changes itself, right? It it it, it undergoes metamorphosis or it changes its configuration. And then it comes, it looks like TSH and then it binds receptor. Now as it is binding, it is causing excessive stimulation. Now this excessive stimulation will cause excessive release of T3, T4. Now this excessive release of T3, T4 is what we call it as thyrotoxicosis, right? Now this is what is going to happen in Graves disease, right? Now Graves is also associated with HLA. It is associated with HLA and the HLA, it is associated with HLA B8 and HLA BR3. Right? It will be associated with the HLAs that is HLA B8, HLA DR3. Okay. Now, in terms of Plummer's disease, uh, it's a complication of long standing untreated multinodal goiter, the other one is idiopathic, right? Now, in terms of investigation, right? So I'll write HLA here. We'll write it is associated with the HLA. We're talking about in terms of Graves disease. So HLA, we're talking about it is going to be HLA B8, HLA DR3, right? HLA DR3. Now, uh, what are the investigations that you can do here for any thyroid patient? I would do a thyroid function test. So TFT will be done for all of the following. I would be performing an ultrasound to see whether it is smooth or nodular. Remember, there is no role of FNAC in toxic swellings because toxic swellings are very unlikely to be malignant. Yes, I would use an iodine 123 as an radioactive isotope for diagnosis in terms of diagnosis that you'll keep across, right? Now, in terms of Graves disease, how would you manage? It all depends upon whether the patient is age less than 40 years or age more than 40 years. Age less than 40 years, we are going to go ahead with total thyroidectomy. We're going to remove the entire thyroid gland. I'm going to operate and remove the entire gland per se. That is total thyroidectomy. Uh, in terms of multinodal goiter, if it is involving only one side, then I am going to go ahead with lobectomy. On the other hand, if it is involving both the lobes, then we'll go with total thyroidectomy. Here, it is going to be lobectomy alone because it involves only one lobe. It's a solitary nodule that you have. Uh, in Graves disease, I'll go with radioactive iodine ablation more than if it is the patient is more than 40, that is radioactive iodine 131. Here, I'll still go with surgery. In uh, toxic adenoma again iodine 131 is used now when we say iodine 123 uh, it is going to be associated with gamma radiation that is used for diagnosis iodine 131 on the other hand it emits gamma as well as beta beta is responsible for ablation now, when you say iodine 123 the average t half is going to be 13 hours alone but the T half of iodine 131 is 8 days. Remember, here we're talking about hours and here we're talking about days. That is what you have to remember, right? Okay, so this is in terms of management of the complete context, right? So uh, this happens to be in terms of impl uh, implicated response as well. 
that you need to understand. Chal. So when you do a radioactive iodine scan, there are a couple of scans that I've given in front of you so that we'll be able to understand and try to emulate as well, right? Now, it's a very simple concept. Uh, if you have more amount of radioactive iodine, uh, if it is going to be uptaken, then we'll say it is hyperactive gland. If it is less, less taking, we've got a hypoactive gland. Uh, I don't want to go into greater details, but I can give you in a simple format to understand. Let's say if this is the thyroid gland that is present. Right. Now let's understand the concept, right? Uh, in Graves disease, in plumber's disease, uh, there is hyperplasia. There is increase in number of cells that you need to understand. Now let's uh, understand if, if I give you, uh, I will say, let's say these are the thyroid follicles that are present, right? Now these follicles consist of these active follicular, these are the follicular lumen, these are the follicular cells. Uh, and these follicular cells are going to amalgamate or you can say they present as one single segment. So the multiple cells and these are your follicular lumen that is present. Now let's understand it this way, right? Uh, whenever you give a radioactive iodine, that radioactive iodine will go and get absorbed into the thyroid follicles and it will illuminate. Now remember the uptake will purely depend upon number of actively proliferating cells or number number of active follicles that are present, right? If the follicles which are present, which are more active, you'll have more uptake. If the follicles which are present in the gland are less active, you'll have less uptake, right? Now, solitary means single, it means alone, right? Now, whenever you have a, a radioactive iodine uptake, we will only be able to see the uptake part, right? So in an uptake part, if I give you in a nutshell, you will see the gland will have an outline like this, which is present. And you will notice the uptake would be like this, right? This is what we call it as a normal uptake. Let's say, imagine this is a normal uptake, right? Now, you need to understand, sometimes you might have a presentation. I'll, I'll leave it to you and you tell me the diagnosis. Let's say this time, we had an isolated uptake. So we have something like this where the uptake was uniform throughout the gland. In one particular area, I noticed there is an extensive or a very large uptake, a massive uptake, right? Now, how would you interpret that? I would say there's a lot of uptake, which is more when compared to the surrounding area. And probably this is a nodular swelling. And this is what we call it as hot nodule. I'm, I'm not calling it as hot because it is warm. I'm calling it as hot because it has got very, very or massive uptake, uh, which is usually seen in toxic nodules. So this is what we call it as a hot nodule or a hyperactive nodule that you have, right? On the other hand, on the other hand, if you have another aspect, let's say I'll take another uh, thyroid uptake. Let's say this is the gland that is present. And here we see that, you know, normally this is the uptake that is expected, right? This is the uptake that is expected in every part of the thyroid gland, right? But in one particular area, I see there is no uptake at all. Now, or a very little uptake. So you can see this area of the thyroid gland uh, to make it less, it's a very little uptake. So when you compare from the surrounding areas, uh, when you look at the other normal scans, you see the active uptake is present throughout the gland. In some areas, it is more, I would say hot, but this, if the uptake in a certain area of the gland is very less, that means in this area, there is no uptake, there's no activity proliferating cells, or there is associative damage. It is usually seen in tumor, which is having a tumor necrosis, suppressive necrosis, and this is what we call as cold nodule, right? This is what we call it as cold nodule. And there is something called as warm nodule where if you have a nodular swelling which is having the same amount of uptake as gland, then we call it as warm nodule, right? Okay. Now in this context, this is what we call it as, let's say if there is a nodule that is present and the nodule has the same uptake as the surrounding gland, I will call this as warm nodule. If the uptake is more than the surrounding gland, we call it as hot nodule. And if the uptake is less than the surrounding gland, we call it as cold nodule. Now, a million dollar question. If you have a Graves disease, what type of uptake will you expect? Graves means toxic. That means more cells, more active proliferation, more release of gland, more release of secretion. Gland is also large, more uptake. It is going to be hot. 
tumors what do you expect cold nodules remember presence of cold nodules should be suspicious of malignancy or tumor you have to go and kill that part right remember in graves graves is what active proliferation more cells more cells means more follicles more follicles means more uptake more uptake means hot it is more hot means more it is going to be more in content right yeah graves because the entire gland is enlarging it will have diffuse uptake when i give you here you can see very clearly right now the same concept if i apply here you can see this is an area of the gland where there is no uptake hence i am calling it as cold nodule right now i can see here this is a uniform hyper uptake all across the gland and usually the concentration of follicles are also more on the upper lobe hence it is going to be hot and it is graves right now you see certain areas in certain areas you have more and certain areas you have less indicates what multi nodular and it is toxic right if there's an isolated uptake in one particular area it is going to be your toxic adenoma now that is hot nodule as you can see isolated uptake is what we call it as autonomous nodule if the uptake in the entire gland is decreased that means what the whole gland is getting ablated or damaged that is seen in inflammatory thyroid swelling chronic inflammatory disease thyroiditis any chronic inflammation in the body will heal by fibrosis it is an evidence of fibrosis right so these are the uptakes so this is how you know whether you're talking about cold you're talking about graves toxic mandonda goiter hot nodule autonomous or thyroiditis right i hope everybody is clear with this clear guys clear okay can we move on So, okay. <clears throat> now, again, your previous exam question. Uh, this has been a very, very important question. They asked you, what is the optimum cytology criteria in a thyroid swelling? Right? Now, Dunhill procedure, uh, also called as the Hartley Dunhill procedure. Somebody is asking the procedures. Uh, quickly talking about where if you take this as the thyroid gland, uh, what can you do with the thyroid gland? How well can you remove it? What can you remove it? Where can you remove it? We'll tell you about the various procedures that we have. Now, if you remove both the right and the left lobe, you remove both the right lobe and the left lobe and the isthmus. This is what we call it as total thyroidectomy. If you remove lobe and isthmus, if you remove the lobe and the isthmus, this is now called as lobectomy. Earlier we used to call it as hemithyroidectomy. If you only remove the lobe, leaving behind the lobe and the isthmus, this is what we call it as total lobectomy. This is what we call it as total lobectomy. These are the normally done. The fancy procedures that we have in a subtotal thyroidectomy. Now in a subtotal thyroidectomy, what I will do is on the either side of the gland, on the superior pole or on the inferior pole, I will leave a small amount of thyroid gland. Usually we are going to leave anywhere between 4 to 5 grams. We leave anywhere between 4 to 5 grams of the thyroid gland on the either side. And this is what we call it as subtotal thyroidectomy. Now the question that was asked was what is an Hartley Dunhill procedure? In an Hartley Dunhill procedure rather than leaving some amount of gland on the either lobe, I will leave a small amount in one particular lobe and rest of the thyroid gland will be removed. Now the controversy in Hartley Dunhill is how much amount of gland is left behind, right? Now in few textbooks, it says 4 to 8 grams is left behind. Few textbooks says 10 to 12 grams. Single best answer, I would say 4 to 10 grams would be left behind, right? It should be left in one particular side and this is what we call it as the Hartley Dunhill procedure. This is called as the Hartley Dunhill procedure. Right now, another surgery uh, that we do it still, I mean, uh, on an often basis, uh, that is to divide the isthmus. Right now, if you only divide the isthmus and remove the isthmus, right, 
if you are removing this off this is what we call it as isthmectomy this is what we call it as isthmectomy right now remember isthmectomy is considered to be as the surgery of choice to relieve pressure symptoms to relieve pressure symptoms in an inoperable thyroid condition in an inoperable thyroid swelling in an inoperable thyroid swelling in an inoperable thyroid swelling right now when we say what are the examples of inoperable thyroid swelling uh, there are a couple of inoperable thyroid swellings that we have number one if there is a Hashimoto's thyroiditis you can also have <coughs> Riedel's thyroiditis and obviously the anaplastic thyroid cancer these are the swellings which are considered to be inoperable if they are associated with pressure symptoms clear right so these are the various surgeries that we do total we have lobectomy we have total lobectomy subtotal and the heart rate and procedure right i hope that answers your question okay okay so, so moving on uh, another important aspect is the fnsc of the thyroid swelling and the criteria that we are about to discuss is the optimum cytology criteria recent central exam question right recent central exam question all right now when you talk about the size of the needle what is the size of the needle that should be used for optimum cytology that is your 23 gauge needle uh what should how many times should you aspirate that particular nodule to get a very good yield that has to be you not know, two aspirates uh, remember there has to be six follicles per aspirate and there has to be 10 to 15 cells uh, per follicle if these are not present then we would say that it is suboptimal cytology to have the optimum cytology use a good needle take two aspirates and then make sure you have a minimum of six half follicles per aspirate and 10 to 15 cells per aspirate right now on the basis of the fnsa report you have the following classification we call it as the thigh based classification starting with thigh 1 to thigh 1 5 right so thigh 1 to thigh 5 right thigh 1 what is thigh 1 it is a non diagnostic aspirate uh, that could be because of multiple reasons uh, if you have not aspirated from a good site if, if you have only aspirated a necrotic area or you have not followed the optimum cytology criteria all these are going to be important right thigh 1 c it is non diagnostic cystic aspirate it is going to be a non-diagnostic cystic aspirate. Thigh 2, we call it as non-neoplastic swelling. Thigh 3, it is simply called as follicular origin. Now, why we call it as follicular origin? Because FNSC in a thyroid swelling has a limitation. It cannot differentiate between follicular endoma and follicular carcinoma. So, whenever there is a follicular origin swelling, what will you do? I will take immediately patient for lobectomy with frozen section that is on table frozen section would be performed so once you do an on table frozen section when you do a lobectomy with frozen section i will be able to identify whether it is an adenoma or carcinoma so a very very important question that if you have a thigh 3 category what are you going to do next immediate step <coughs> take the patient for lobectomy with frozen section right on the other hand, when you look at the thigh 4 category, what is thigh 4? It is suspicious of malignancy. Now, obviously, when you are talking about suspicious of malignancy, which has not been proven, you will take it the same. Lobectomy with frozen section. Thigh 5, it is a proven. That is, it is a malignant swell. It is a malignant swell. Clear? So, these are the applications right now when you have a non-diagnostic aspirate or non-diagnostic cystic aspirate what do you do you do a repeat fnsc under ultrasound guidance we do a usg guided fnsc should be performed a usg guided fnsc should be performed okay so this is about the optimum cytology criteria
Now, another important uh, thyroid swelling that you'll talk about is going to be an inflammatory thyroid swelling. Uh, we have three important inflammatory thyroid swelling. We have the Hashimoto's, we have the d and the Riedel's thyroiditis. All right. Now, now a couple of important questions. What is it? What type of inflammation is Hashimoto's? Hashimoto's is an example of chronic. d is an example of subacute inflammation. Riedel's is an example of chronic inflammation. It is an inf it's an example of chronic inflammation. What is the etiology? Hashimoto's, it is autoimmune. It is going to be autoimmune. d -curvians, it is post-viral upper respiratory tract infection. Riedel's, it is considered to be idiopathic. But if it is not idiopathic, it can also be autoimmune. AI stands for autoimmune. For us, it is AI is autoimmune. For rest of the world, it is artificial intelligence, right? Now, in terms of pathophysiology, Hashimoto's, no. Now, there is an antibody that is formed. It is called as an anti-TPO antibody, right? Now, it is associated with HLA. You remember our graves? It was B8, HLA DR3. One more HLA you add, it is HLA DR5, right? Now, what happens in terms of pathophysiology is, uh, these antibodies, these are anti-TPO antibodies which are formed, they want to kill the thyroperoxidase enzyme. So this is the anti-TPO anti antibody. Now one fine day, these anti-TPO antibodies, they decide that they want to go and kill the thyroperoxidase. But the problem is the thyroperoxidase enzyme which is present, that is present inside the thyroid follicle. Right. So these antibodies, no, they go down to the follicle. They say, uh, dude, can you please send the thyroperoxidase out so that I can kill it? Right. The follicle says get lost. Right. What do you think? Who the hell are you? Right. If I give TPO, who will do my work in the follicles? Because every step in providing or forming the iodine into T3, T4 is catalyzed by thyroperoxidase. Follicle says I'm not going to give. Right. Now these antibodies are angry, but the problem is they're not strong enough to kill the follicles. Follicles will give him one punch, these antibodies will die. Antibody says, I have to do something, I have to kill this TPO. So when you can't kill somebody or when you can't hit anybody, what will you do? What best can you do? You go hire somebody who is good at doing this, right? So you go down and you say, you take help. You hire assassins, right? You go hire Bhai Log, right? You go hire, you know, those... People who are sharpshooters in our body, we have CD4 cells. So it goes and tells CD4 cells that I want to kill TPO. TPO is done so bad to me. I have, I have uh, the sole purpose of my birth is to kill TPO and I want my birthright. CD4 cells, okay, okay, okay. I get your point. But uh, see, it's a, it's, a, it's a small job. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. I'll send the best assassin I have. That is your CD4 cells, right? Now the problem is CD, sorry, CD8 cells, right? Cytotoxic CD8 cells, uh, so CD4 cells, when they get activated, they activate CD8 cells. CD8 cells is all right, I got it. But the problem with CD8 cells now, it doesn't go and talk. Now, Gaya, he went there. All that he does is straight up smashes. CD8 cells goes, the follicle wants to talk to him. He wants to offer some terms and conditions of submission. But CD8 cells is, it's too late, dude. I am here. When I am here, you can't be here, right? So it is like your Rajnikanth, right? It goes down there, doesn't listen, it starts shooting and the minute it comes, it is going to attack your thyroid follicles. Now, as soon as the thyroid follicles are attacked, the thyroid follicles have no other option but to die. Now, these CD8 cells, they are going to go and they are going to damage the follicular cell. Now, the follicular cell is ruptured. Now, as the follicular cells are ruptured, you will see the thyroperoxidase enzymes are released out. Now, as the TPO is released out, these antibodies are going to engulf and they say, yes, victory, right? We got our revenge. The problem is not revenge. Is pure chakkar mein kiska nuksaan ho gaya, right? Follicle bacha ra tha na, TPO ko. TPO chal diya aur follicle lut gaya, right? The follicle died. The follicle is disrupted, ruptured. It is gone. It is no more. All that I can say is rest in peace. So follicles are no more. So in this manner, there will be progressive damage of follicles. As more and more follicles damage, there will be compensatory hypertrophy of the rest of the follicles. And that is how the gland enlarges, right? Now, this, when you talk about d it is because of cross-reacting 
antigen antibody complex that is developed because of viral upper respiratory tract infection it is associated with hla b35 there is no specific antibody here there is no specific hla here and there are no antibodies so if you talk about antibodies in readles now if it, it it's usually idiopathic it can be autoimmune but if it is autoimmune it is associated with igg4 class of antibodies right now these igg4 class of antibodies they are also associated with hormones disease that is your idiopathic retrovirus fibrosis it is associated with redel thyroiditis also right so these these are associated with chronic disorders which are autoimmune right now there is no specific pathophysiology here in terms of redels redels no i can give you a simple example one fine day thyroid gland was sitting and thinking about future you know think about what to be done how best i can live my life uh, what can i achieve in life you no know, all these were the thoughts uh, but then thyroid realizes ki life mein kuch ho nahi sakta can't do much about it so it decides so yaar yeah, kya kya what can we do let's die and it suicides so few of the follicles they give up and they die now because the guys who have went the problem is not the guys who go uh, the problem is the guys who are left behind because these guys who have gone they're dead the rest of the guys have to take up their work no so in order to compensate for their loss these will undergo hypertrophy as well as hyperplasia and all the follicles enlarge and as they enlarge as they enlarge you notice the entire gland is going to enlarge as well now this entire gland that is enlarged will be fibrosed as well so it's a fibrosed enlarged thyroid gland right it's a fibrosed enlarged thyroid gland right it's a fibrosed enlarged thyroid gland and redels is how this is how the whole gland is going to become enlarged but it is going to be fibrosed it's going to be hard fibrosed thyroid gland that is going to be present now when you look at the age of presentation right at what age would you see these patients are coming across here right now in terms of hashimotos it is between 30 to 40 years right now in terms of your de curvens it is also seen between 30 to 50 years redels is seen after the age of 50 years it's an uh, i would say rather than yeah in few textbooks it is given as 40 few says it is 50 uh, higher the age better the answer right now all thyroid disorders are more common in female this is also going to be female here the patient will present to you with complaints of thyroid swelling but eventually there will be signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism so this is the final status where the patient will be hypothyroid in d curvens thyroiditis there is no thyroid swelling there will be pain in the thyroid region there will be pain in thyroid region and along with pain in the thyroid region the component of pain increases during swallowing because this is going to move upwards and there will be some order of neck edema we call it as presence of neck fullness is noticed there is presence of neck fullness that is noticed across here right on the other hand we talk about redel thyroiditis you have a massive thyroid swelling there is a massive thyroid swelling that will be present here along with this massive massive thyroid swelling there will be associated pressure symptoms along with associated pressure symptoms along with the associated pressure symptoms the patient will have signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism there will be signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism right now what are the initial status in hashimotos as soon as the follicle ruptures there is excessive release there is hyper right now there is no intermediate phase but what you will notice eventually when all the follicles fibrous there is no hormone that is produced eventually it will become hyper in due curvens this cross reacting antigen antibody complex will stimulate more so there will be excessive release body will take some time to build up the reserve once the inflammation subsides so transiently there will be hypo but eventually they will become u thyroid once the inflammation subsides you didn't do anything it's self limiting in your redels from day 1 the follicles keep disrupting hence the status of the gland will become less productive hormone production decreases it will remain hypo throughout its life right 
what are the investigations for all of them i would do a thyroid function test a tft will be done here also a tft will be done here also right we will do an ultrasound we will also do an ultrasound here we'll do an ultrasound here we will do an fnsc in hashimoto's and riddles there is no role in decurvians decurvians is self limiting i'm not going to do anything here i will start the patient on thyroxine which is a t4 supplementation remember if these patients if they are associated with severe pressure symptoms if they are associated with severe pressure symptoms then how would you like to deal with it if they are associated with severe pressure symptoms don't try to be a hero don't try to be a god don't try to remove the entire gland i told you surgery of choice for inoperable thyroid swellings especially in terms of chronic inflammation where there's a lot of fibrosis around the gland it is going to be isthmectomy we'll go ahead only to perform isthmectomy All right and this is your exam question All right so so far any questions guys so far any questions quick feedback quick feedback so far so good okay All right, so let's do it this way. Uh, we'll call in for a short break. It's been two hours from uh, the start of the session. So in thyroid, any contraindication of FNAC? Toxic swellings, you cannot do FNAC. It's a, it's a relative contraindication and it should be avoided. Any vascular swellings, species of hemangiomas, again, biopsy should be avoided. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna break it down for 15 minutes. Uh, the clock says, 8:20, right? So 8:35, we'll resume back, right? Call in for a short break. We'll resume back at 8:35.
all right guys welcome back right so let's kick start from where we left on uh we'll take a little bit more into rapid session uh so let's summarize what we talk about right so uh next important topic is about thyroid cancers you'd have learned in pathology also slash medicine they'll be talking about various genes and various malignancies so syndromes which are associated with thyroid cancers are absolutely important so what are the syndromes that are associated with thyroid cancers Number one is FAP, familial endomatous polyposis, Gardner syndrome, Werner syndrome, MEN2 and Cowden's disease. What are the genes for FAP and Gardner? It is APC gene which is seen on chromosome number 5. Werner syndrome is WRN gene. MEN2 is RET gene mutation. Cowden's is P10 gene mutation. Now the question is with FAP which is the most common cancer? Answer is papillary cancer thyroid. With Gardner's the most common is follicular cancer thyroid. With Werner's, all cancers are seen except anaplastic. Men, it is medullary cancer thyroid. Cowden's, it is seen as differentiated thyroid cancer. DTC is differentiated thyroid cancer. And that differentiated thyroid cancer is going to be follicular cancer thyroid as well as papillary cancer thyroid. Okay? Papillary cancer thyroid as well as follicular thyroid cancer. So, moving down. Uh, we'll talk about the comparative data in terms of pa papillary follicular anaplastic as well as medullary cancer thyroid. Uh, okay. Now, uh, guys, those who are trying to disturb on the uh, chat box, uh, I would request you not to because uh, this is a serious session and uh, I do take my job seriously, right? Fine. Uh, any other complaints, uh, guys? Please don't entertain on the chat box. Uh, let's not get distracted. Okay. Chal. So when you talk about the papillary cancer thyroid, uh, in terms of thyroid cancers, we have papillary follicular anaplastic as well as medullary. Uh, I don't know. So, in terms of papillary follicular anaplastic and medullary cancer thyroid, we'll talk about in terms of origin. Remember, papillary cancer thyroid originates from thyroid follicles. Follicular cancer also originates from thyroid follicles. Anaplastic also originates from thyroid follicles. Medullary cancer arises from parafollicular C cells. They originate from parafollicular C cells, right? Now, if I say what is the most common thyroid cancer, the answer is papillary. It is the overall most common. But if I say the most common thyroid cancer in ectopic thyroid gland, in an ectopic thyroid gland, the answer is follicular, right? The one which is associated with the worst prognosis. The one which is associated with the worst prognosis, it is the anaplastic cancer. And medullary cancer thyroid, this is associated as familial thyroid cancer and men syndrome. That is multiple endocrine neoplasia. Alright. Chal. Now, when you talk about the age of presentation, you have to be absolutely vigilant in thyroid cancers. Remember, the papillary cancer thyroid is seen between age 30 to 50 years. Follicular age more than 50 years. Anaplastic more than 60 years. And medullary cancer, they exist in two forms. One is the sporoidic form. That is, anybody can have it. And one that is associated with men's syndrome. Sporoidic age above 50 men, it is around 20 years, right? Now, all thyroid cancers and thyroid disorders are more common in female. They are more common in female throughout, right? Now, what is the most common gene associated? The BRAF mutation is most common for papillary cancer thyroid. P10 is most common for follicular cancer thyroid. There is no specific gene for anaplastic, but RET is the most common gene associated with medullary cancer thyroid, right? It is the medullary cancer thyroid. Now, when you talk about the risk factors, what are the important risk factors that you have? Two important risk factors for papillary cancer thyroid that you cannot forget. Number one, if there is presence or history of thyroglossal duct cyst, right? 
Now the second important factor that you need to understand here if there is history of ionizing <coughs> radiation exposure. If there is history of ionizing radiation exposure, right? Now, what is the important risk factor for alkali cancer thyroid? It is a long standing. If there is presence of long standing untreated goiter, a long standing untreated goiter is what is an important risk factor. Anaplastic, nothing specific. We can say medullary cancer is associated with men to A and men to B, right? So it is usually the multiple endocrine neoplasia, right? Now, in terms of <clears throat> in terms of clinical presentation, so one second, guys. It just jump pages. Okay. In terms of clinical features, papillary cancer thyroid, right? So papillary cancer thyroid is going to present to you either as a solitary thyroid nodule. They present a solitary thyroid nodule with cervical lymphadenopathy. With cervical lymphadenopathy. That is one way of presentation. Or they can simply present to you as lateral aberrant thyroid. They can simply present to you as lateral aberrant thyroid. Okay. Now what is this lateral aberrant thyroid? Lateral aberrant thyroid is a condition where a patient presents to you with there is no thyroid swelling primarily thyroid swelling does not exist there is no thyroid swelling but there is presence of cervical lymph node metastasis right so you have a patient who presents with lateral neck swelling you do an fnse you found out to be a thyroid cell where did it come from it came from here it migrated from here to here how why will it migrate it will only migrate if there is metastasis right so lateral aberrant thyroid is another presentation for papillary cancer thyroid Follicular cancer thyroid, on the other hand, will have goiter-like presentation. It will have goiter-like presentation. But along with the goiter-like presentation, along with the goiter-like presentation, patient will have a forehead, forehead pulsatile bony swelling. A forehead pulsatile bony swelling is what is going to be present across here. Now, why will there be a forehead pulsatile bony swelling? Obviously, it will be because of metastasis, right? Why, what type of metastasis there? If the patient will have osteolytic secondaries because the most common site for metastasis is bones across here and osteolytic secondary will develop as a forehead pulsatile bony swellings that you're going to see here, right? Uh, when you talk about the anaplastic cancer, the patient will present to you with a huge thyroid swelling. Now, this huge thyroid swelling will be associated with severe pressure symptoms. It is associated with severe pressure symptoms. It is associated with severe pressure symptoms. So, huge thyroid swelling with severe pressure symptoms and most importantly there will be a lot of local infiltration because of local infiltration you will also have patient with the frozen neck medullary cancer thyroid will present to you a solitary thyroid nodule like presentation with history of diarrhea now why will there be a diarrhea because medullary cancer thyroid as a paraneoplastic syndrome can produce more amount of 5 ht3 which is serotonin and the effect of serotonin on GI mucosa is stimulatory as excessive stimulation will result in secretory diarrhea. So solid thyroid not like presentation with diarrhea always think in terms of medullary cancer thyroid. And if the patient, if the patient also have hypertension with the headache. Now this is where you have to rule out what? Quick feedback. What do you want to rule out? You also want to rule out FIO chromocytoma you want to rule out few chromocytoma in simple words you see whether it is associated with men syndrome 
whether it is associated with men syndrome or not right so this is how you look across in terms of clinical presentation so that we'll be able to differentiate among all the differentials that you have remember in any clinical approach or any clinical scenarios you should always have differentials and you should be able to differentiate among that right now what is the mode of spread remember the most common route of spread for papillary cancer is going to be lymphatics this is going to be hematogenous anaplastic is going to be direct this is going to be both lymphatics as well as a hematogenous route of spread as well as the hematogenous route of spread what is the most common site for secondary is for papillary it is lungs here it is going to be bones again it is going to be lungs for anaplastic by direct infiltration here it is liver if not then into bones now the question is what type of secondaries in bones are you expecting in follicular it is osteolytic in medullary cancer it is osteoblastic if you have a confusion a simple mnemonic remember master blaster master is medullary blaster is blastic sachin tendulkar right so you have blastic secondaries in medullary cancer thyroid right that you are going to understand right so this is this is how you need to look across here in terms of metastasis uh, for all the standard approach the investigation that you have to follow across here it is going to be obviously because these are thyroid swellings uh, we will perform fnses for all of the following right obviously ultrasound would also be do, done to evaluate for the cervical status uh, and the radioactive iodine scan to look for any metastasis or any other finding that are present now what are the findings that you can expect on a histopathology right number one you can see there is an empty cell without nucleus and this is what we call it as the orphan any i nuclei right another finding that you can see is these concentric circles these concentric circles is what we call it as the samoma bodies now when we say samoma bodies the samoma bodies are the example of dystrophic calcification these are the examples of dystrophic calcification now when we say there is a dystrophic calcification in dystrophic calcification what are the other conditions where you will see the same now remember your favorite subject what is your favorite subject psm right now now p stands for the papillary variant the papillary variant of renal cell carcinoma as well as thyroid cancer s stands for serous cyst adenoma of ovaries it is the serous cyst adenoma of ovaries and m stands for meningiomas these are the conditions where you will see presence of samoma bodies right now if you see these are abandoned status right so you have two important orphan anii nuclei and the samoma bodies you should be able to identify them and you should be able to give the differentials where else you can see samomas right uh when you talk about the hp findings in terms of follicular cancer thyroid you can see the cluster of cells which are not stained by dyes these are what we call it as oxyphilic cells there is an excessive abundant oxyphilic cells these if they are present it indicates herthel cell carcinoma it indicates the herthel cell carcinoma which is a variant <clears throat> which is a variant of medullary cancer thyroid it is a aggressive variant it is the aggressive variant of follicular cancer thyroid but before we move down a very interesting thing that if you do an fnse can you diagnose your follicular cancer thyroid the answer is no as you all know if you do fnse your pathologist is going to tell you sir it is thai 3 variety do your job i don't know what is thai 3 follicular origin what is follicular origin i don't know whether it is adenoma carcinoma why because the single most important reason because fnse cannot differentiate so how do you differentiate 
between the follicular adenoma and the follicular carcinoma how do you differentiate between follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma what is the criteria to differentiate the criteria is very simple we will see is there any capsular breach is there any capsular breach by the thyroid tumor or is there any vascular breach now here is a simple thing right if there is no capsular or vascular breach it is follicular adenoma if there is presence of both capsular and vascular breach it is follicular carcinoma right so once you do your frozen your pathologist is going to look up and tell you whether it is adenoma or carcinoma the minute you say it is carcinoma you do a completion thyroidectomy if it is adenoma you leave it at your lobectomy status and come back right so this is what an important aspect looks like anaplastic cancer nothing specific about it but medullary cancer thyroid i hope you are able to see these these strands projecting into the stromal status and this is what we call it as the amyloid infiltrations so presence of amyloid in stroma is a characteristic feature of medullary cancer thyroid so papillary is orphan anion nuclei with some of our bodies if there is capsular vascular breach that is carcinoma that is follicular carcinoma in terms of medullary cancer thyroid there is presence of amyloid strands right very 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 important right i hope you are able to conclude with that particular context right now now <clears throat> so this is all that with respect to breast of the thyroid any quick questions on thyroid quick feedback anything that you want to ask quick question quick question okay all right so let's move on uh, okay so take up the breast again uh, again a very very important topic <clears throat> uh ankur uh, men i'll be dealing tomorrow because we're talking about neuroendocrine tumor so tomorrow will be a neuroendocrine tumor day so don't worry about it okay see relation of hashimotos and papillary cancer thyroid is not a very strong one so we'll not tell you as a uniform risk factor yes it is associated it is also associated with lymphomas also thyroid lymphomas uh readles uh, again very unlikely chances of it converting but yes associated with lymphomas as well again all those are gray areas i'm not going to touch upon that because in exam point let's keep a uniform focus of what to be dealt and answered during the exam okay now we we'll talk about breast let's quickly talk about it <coughs> now when it comes down to breast no for any lump in the breast now for any lump in the breast if a patient presents to you with a lump in breast we have to go ahead with triple assessment uh, i hope everybody knows the components of triple assessment it is going to be a clinical examination with a radiological assessment with cytological confirmation right if you follow this the sensitivity is 99.9% right or according to the new textbook it is 100% sensitivity it is very unlikely that you are going to miss any diagnosis of breast lump as simple as that right now uh normally we see that the breast cancers are on an uptrend we know the incidence are very high but if i ask you what is the most common malignancy female worldwide right now most common cancer female worldwide as of now anybody most common cancer female worldwide quick feedback quick feedback quick feedback quick feedback anybody anybody quick feedback okay the answer is lungs theek hai it is now replaced from breast that is what you remember now when you do in terms of breast i know the incidence of breast cancers are high so we'll go with normal screening right now what is the age for screening for breast cancer age 
for screening for breast cancer is about 40 years right this age for screening changes in high risk population it is after 25 years in general population it is 20 it is 40 for high risk it is going to be 25 it is going to be 25 now when you have the biroids as the scoring status, uh, we say breast imaging, reporting and data system. We have following categories, category zero, incomplete assessment. It could be because of either the patient does not show up, if there's a wrong imaging of the breast, matlab, pathology is in the right imaging is done on the left, incomplete imaging, poor quality, all that is category zero, repeat, as simple as that. Okay. Now, category one, negative, that means patient came for screening, there is no lesion, you will ask for annual repeat mammogram, that is what we advise for. Category two, it is benign, no need to worry, you should go for routine screening. Category three is your exam question, it is says probably benign, that means possibility of malignancy less than 2%, but why it is an exam question, because you'll ask the patient to come back for follow up after how many days, after six months. Right, routine screening is annual. This is where you'll ask the patient to come back after six months. Suspicious for malignancy, right? You have low, moderate, and high suspicion. Low, moderate, and high. We say low, moderate, and high suspicion. For all these, you have to go ahead with true cut biopsy. Category five, highly suspicious of malignancy, more than 95. Conclude with biopsy. Category six, biopsy proven 100% stage wise management, right? It is going to be stage wise management very very important now very important topic uh, which you'll see in your day-to-day -day life is your breast abscess again important from the exam perspective as well what is the most important risk factor the most important risk factor for forming a breast abscess is lactation the most common organism is going to be staph or the most common source it is the feeding baby the baby that is feeding is what brings the communal right it brings the Right, it brings the bacteria right across here. What is the clinical feature? Remember, in breast abscess, it is an example of acute mastitis. Now, when we say it is a feature of acute mastitis, acute mastitis is inflammation. Any inflammation of rubber, color, dollar tumor, same features are going to be present. Patient is going to have mastalgia. Patient is going to have fever. Patient is going to have erythema that is going to be present on top, right? Now, very important thing is about a fluctuation sign. Now, remember, we always tell you that whenever there's a fluid filled cavity in the body, it will have a positive fluctuation sign. What do you mean by a fluctuation sign is imagine if this is a fluid filled cavity. Right. Take this as a representation of fluid filled cavity anywhere in the body. This fluid filled can be an abscess. It could be a cyst. It could be a hematoma. Anything which is fluid filled. All that you have to do is you have to take and put one finger at one end of the swelling. Exert or put one finger at one end of the swelling and another finger on the other end of the swelling. All that you have to do is to exert pressure from one end. Right. You have to exert pressure from one end. I will call this as the examining finger. This is the observing finger. Now, because you are exerting pressure from one end, and it's a fluid filled cavity, fluid can be displaced easily. You will notice uh, as you are exerting finger, you will see the swelling is going to deform. You will notice all this fluid that is present on this end is being displaced uh, onto the other end. Now, as the fluid is being displaced, the point where you are exerting the pressure, that particular end, it is going to be compressed. You will see that part of the swelling will become depressed, but the observing finger is being pushed away. That is all because of the pressure exerted by the fluid that is displacing. Now, what I'll do is I will repeat this activity. Now, this is what we call it as the examining and the observing finger. I will repeat the activity and this time I will use the observing finger to exert pressure now because the fluid will displace but this time it will displace in the opposite direction as you are exerting the pressure from this finger it is going to compress the swelling and this is going to elevate and you will see the entire fluid that is present it is going to be displaced it is going to be displaced 
on to the other end and you will notice that the finger is being pushed away you will notice that the finger is being pushed away and this pushing away of finger is what we call it as the fluctuation sign this is what we call it as the fluctuation sign right so i hope you are able to understand uh, how do you elucidate fluctuation sign clinically also so next time you go down to the ward you know what to do right now this is what we call it as a positive fluctuation sign but the problem is there are certain sites in the body where you cannot a demonstrate fluctuation sign right or we can say fluctuation sign is negative or delayed even in the presence of swelling right now of fluid filled cavity the the context is what we call it as later or delayed fluctuation sign for example if there is a fluid or an abscess that is collected in the breast and you try to do a fluctuation test you do the fluctuation test in a normal breast the normal breast itself is fluctuating so you'll get it positive now your biggest question is is it the breast which is fluctuant or if there is a swelling inside is that fluctuant because breast per se is fluctuant and if there is a fluid filled cavity inside the breast you might have fluctuation but the problem is you'll not be able to differentiate whether it is the breast fluctuating or the swelling fluctuating hence we call it as delayed fluctuation as uh, the swelling has to become so big that it has to come out of the surface of the breast and then you will be able to elucidate fluctuation sign that you need to notice across here now what are the sites where you have delayed fluctuation sign in the body fortunately everything starts with p this is your parotid abscess remember the simple cartoon right this is your pectoral abscess when we say pectoral it is nothing but your breast abscess the word pectoral is representing breast this is your palmar abscess this is your perineal abscess and this happens to be your plantar abscess this happens to be your plantar abscess right so parotid breast palmar perineal and plantar right so these are the sites so perineal you can say ischio rectal as well right so these are the sites of so delayed fluctuation sign what is the investigation of choice any fluid filled cavity in the body investigation of choice is going to be ultrasound what is the first line management it is usg guided aspiration of the abscess and then put the patient on antibiotics you should aspirate every alternate day you will aspirate every alternate day till you find the cavity is free from abscess if this does not respond if it does not respond you can see we have quantified the abscess you can see this is the abscess that is being quantified see uh, again a very important aspect to quantify or you know to look at the abscess is presence of internal echo whenever there is an infected fluid inside the body it will have fermentation which will have gas and gas will have internal echo presence of internal echo in a collection will always suggest of infected collection if this fails second line and second line is going to be radial incision we are going to put radial incision and drainage of abscess along with the antibiotics along with antibiotics right so this is how you are going to look for management clear so that is with respect to breast abscess clear another very important topic in the breast is going to be breast carcinoma again very very important i'll give you a quick recap on things to remember whenever we talk about breast cancers obviously all of the clinical presentation you will evaluate the investigation of choices through cut biopsy for your uh, metastasis or for i can say the local regional staging it is cct and if you talk about distant metastasis it is a pet scan now as soon as you send a sample for the pathologist the first and the foremost question i'll ask my pathologist is dude is this an in situ malignancy or an invasive malignancy because i have to tell my patient and predict the probability of prognosis on the same if it is in situ it is good if it is invasive it is likely to be bad we'll call it as in situ if it does not breach the basement membrane or the integrity of the basement membrane is maintained if the integrity of the basement membrane is lost or breached we will call it as invasive malignancy right now in terms of in situ i have two components ductal carcinoma in situ and the lobular carcinoma in situ before i move any further lobular carcinoma in situ is not a malignancy 
इट इज अ प्री मैलेग्नेंट कंडीशन सो नाउ दिस इज नॉट कंसिडर्ड टू बी अ मैलेग्नेंट डिसऑर्डर इट इज अ प्री मैलेग्नेंट स्टेटस सो द डिफरेंस बिटवीन दीज टू द एज ऑफ प्रेजेंटेशन डक्टल इज स्लाइटली ऑन द हायर एज लॉबिलर इज अर्ली प्रेजेंटेशन डक्टर विल प्रेजेंट यू विद पेन एंड डिस्चार्ज व्हिच इज अगेन मास इज वेरी अनलाइकली whereas lobular are usually non palpable masses they are seen as a routine mammogram or a screening mammogram that are present remember the possibility of it being multicentric ductal is 40 to 80% lobular is almost certain that is 60 to 90% probability of it being bilateral is only 10 but lobular carcinoma is 70% 7 out of every 10 people will have bilateral presentation the four subtypes of papillary cribriform solid these are associated with good prognosis because they are receptor status the erpr status here are usually positive comodio pattern is what we call it has the black head variety we call it as black head because it is associated with tumor necrosis and whenever there is presence of tumor necrosis it is associated with aggressive nature of the tumor hence comodio is considered to be the aggressive variant of ductal carcinoma in c2 now for diagnosis we'll go with stereotactic biopsy the management is interesting for ductal carcinoma in c2 what will you do remember we have the options as surgery we have the options as chemo the radio and the hormonal therapy remember in c2 there are no roles of chemo and radio the surgery that you can do is simple mastectomy or breast conservative surgery right see multicentric means a multiple lesions which are present on the same breast probably differentiated in two different quadrants multicentric multiple lesions in the same breast so you have a patient with two or three lesions in the same breast on different quadrants but they are malignant this called as multicentric right now hrt if the receptor status of the erpr status is positive then you can go with hormonal replacement therapy now the biggest question is who will decide whether to go with simple mastectomy or the breast conservative surgery it is your patient because the decision here is purely cosmetic remember simple mastectomy is associated with the least risk for recurrence with least risk for recurrence but otherwise we will let the patient choose whether the patient wants to go with simple mastectomy or breast conservative surgery so you have to understand the question if i have an 80 years old female with dcis what is your surgery it has to be simple mastectomy for an 80 years old i am not thinking about cosmosis she herself is not thinking about cosmosis so you don't need to worry about it there we are trying to prevent probability of recurrences that is very very important right now in lobular carcinoma in c2 i say it is a pre malignant condition the problem is it is multicentric and it is bilateral i am saying it is a pre malignant condition but very very important thing it increases the risk for invasive breast cancer it increases the risk for invasive breast cancer so here i have to perform a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy we do a simple mastectomy but bilateral Now the reason I'm using the word prophylactic because it is not proven malignancy yet, right? It is not proven malignancy yet, right? Okay, so this is in terms of management of uh, both uh, when you talk about the ductal carcinoma situ as well as lobular carcinoma situ. Uh, prognosis for DCS has been your previous uh, central exam question. Uh, the index uses Van der Waals prognostic index. uh the components can be remembered by small mnemonics that is wags w stands for width of the tumor or simple words you see the margin of the tumor a stands for age of presentation g is the grade of the tumor or in simple words we talk about the hp type s stands for the size of the tumor s stands for size of the tumor these are the components they have asked you what is the prophylactic or the prognostic index used for breast cancer that is your our dcis that is your one was prognostic index uh we have the tnm classification for eight stages cc nothing spectacular we have already there i am going to give you this pdf so just look across here in terms of revisional status right uh this is your staging protocol again based upon eight stages cc your stage 1 2a 2b your stage 3a 3b and 3c and stage 4 right so this is the criteria that you have to look across here now based upon this i am going to divide them into three different sections 
we have early invasive breast cancer locally advanced breast cancer and advanced breast cancer we'll talk about how do you manage this now for an early invasive breast cancer the first thing is to perform surgery the surgery that we have is either to go with simple mastectomy or breast conservative surgery now the biggest question is what is the criteria for the breast conservative surgery in these patients now the criteria for best conservative surgeries in these patients uh, number one the size of the tumor should be less than four centimeters it should be a solitary lesion it should be limited to one quadrant it should be limited to the one quadrant of breast size should be less than four solitary lesion limited to one quadrant absence of lympho vascular spread absence of lymphovascular spread if all these are satisfied you can go ahead with breast conservative surgery or you have to go with simple mastectomy now problem here is you need to know whether you have to go with axillary clearance or not right but how do you know you're going to go with axillary clearance or not because see normally we have i'll, I'll give you a simple words you need to understand and assess the lymph node status you need to understand the lymph node status in breast cancer right now clinically when you evaluate you have two answers you have clinically node positive so we call it as the node positive disease another one that you have is a node negative disease so whenever there's a node positive disease there is no argument at all here we will go with the axillary clearance here we will go ahead with axillary clearance. Now my biggest question is if it is node negative. Now the problem is, uh, see BC, uh, somebody saying BCS followed by RT. Uh, that means you don't understand what is a BCS is. Breast conservative surgery is nothing but wide local excision with radiotherapy. You cannot say radiotherapy is, an, is, is separately from BCS. No. RT is an integral part of BCS. When I say BCS, that means I'm doing a wide local excision with a 1 millimeter margin or a 2 millimeter margin or sorry, 1 centimeter margin or a 2 centimeter margin depending upon the status with radiotherapy. Without radiotherapy, we cannot call it as BCS. We'll simply call it as wide local excision, right? To call it as BCS, you need to have radiotherapy in it. Okay. Now, Problem with node negative disease, that means, see, when you say nodal status, I would have done a clinical examination of axilla as well as the ultrasound of the axilla. Now, in this, I would say clinically no palpable lymph nodes, ultrasound says there is no enlarged lymph nodes, right? Uh, there are no enlarged lymph nodes. That indicates what? That indicates what? That means... It is okay for now i can think clinically it is no negative but the inner question or a bigger question that i have to ask is it truly node negative is it there could be a tumor that is sitting in the lymph node it is not proliferated yet right so how do you rule out that somebody has given me a right answer yes i will go ahead with sentinel lymph node biopsy sln biopsy right for sentinel lymph node biopsy you can use a dye method where i would be injecting a methylene blue a blue based dye we can use a methylene blue we can use a patent blue or we can use an isosulfan blue right any of these dyes can be utilized and used to form us or to perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy right along with the dye method the another met method that you can use is a radioactive isotope okay in a radioactive isotope, you can use technetium 99 with sulfur colloid. This is another one that you can use. Another one that you have, it is called as Centimag, where you can use injections of ferric oxide. Now, the injections of ferric oxide is given and then you use a magnetic scanner to pick it up, right? Okay. So Centi Mag is there. Then you have another one which is called as a combined method. Uh, guys, somebody is asking the margin for breast conservative surgery. Earlier it was 10 millimeters. Now it is 1 millimeter. It is correct. Earlier it is 10. Now it is 1. 1 millimeter. Earlier it was 1 centimeter. Right. This is a minimal breast tissue should be removed. 
And a combined method, I am going to use technetium 99 with dye based method to get the diagnosis, right? Clear? So, this is in terms of lymph node status. Clear? So, this is how you will manage <clears throat> your stage 1 tumor. Now you have locally advanced breast cancer that is stage 3a, 3b, 3c. For these, what are you going to do? Step number one, I am going to start the patient on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, right? Uh, Manoj, I'll explain you how ERPR positive helps you because hormonal replacement therapies are only going to work if the receptors are present. If there are no receptors, receptors like addresses, right? If you post a letter without an address, where will the letter go? You keep wondering. So in the same way, if there is no receptor expressed on a tumor and you give a hormonal therapy, the drug won't bind to that tumor and it will keep circulating in the body. It is useless, right? So that is why you need to have receptor status positive so that your hormonal therapy works. Now, when we say neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the word neoadjuvant means prior to surgery, which is also called as preoperative chemotherapy. It is the preoperative chemotherapy that you have to give. After giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, I'll take up for surgery. The surgery of choice is modified radical mastectomy. Then you have adjuvant therapy. In the adjuvant therapy, postoperative chemo and postoperative radiotherapy will be given. A postoperative RT will be given. And we will give HRT only if the receptor status is positive. Only if the receptor status is positive. For advanced stages, we will only go ahead with the palliative management. We'll only go ahead with palliative management. That is what you have to remember across here, right? Now, when you talk about the indications of chemotherapy, hormonal therapy and radiotherapy, the most important indication for hormonal therapy is only one if there is ER, PR status is positive. If receptor status is positive, we will give hormonal therapy if not. For indications for chemotherapy, number one, if the ER, PR status is negative. Number two, if it is refractory to hormonal therapy, that means if you have given more than or equal to three cycles of HRT and the tumor is still not responding. Uh, another one, if the patient is having locally advanced breast cancer, that is you have stage 3A, 3B or a 3C tumor, a 3A, 3B or a 3C tumor, then you have to give a, um, your chemotherapy that is important. Uh, the indication for radiotherapy, number one is going to be breast conservative surgery. Number two is locally advanced breast cancer. Locally advanced breast cancer, that is going to be an important aspect for the uh, radiotherapy that you will give. Breast conservative surgery, locally advanced breast cancers, tumor which is greater than 5 centimeters in size. Uh, another important, if more than or equal to 4 lymph nodes are positive with tumor cells. Now remember, whenever you are doing an axillary dissection, no? Uh, minimum number of lymph node that you're going to remove is 12 and the maximum number of lymph node that you're going to remove is 16. Out of these, if more than or equal to 4 lymph nodes are positive, uh, they are positive with tumor cells, then you have to go with post-operative radiotherapy. So breast conservative surgery, locally advanced breast cancers, size greater than 5 centimeters, if more than or equal to 4 lymph nodes are positive with tumor cells, right? Palliative means only supportive care. Palliative means only supportive care, right? Now, what are the regimes that we are commonly going to use? We have the standard calf regime. Uh, we have the standard CMF regime and the paclitaxel based the new regime that is the ACT regime, right? C stands for cyclophosphamide. C stands for cyclophosphamide. A stands for adriamycin. And F stands for 5-fluorouracil. Here C and F remains the same. M stands for methotrexate. Here again A and C remains the same. That is adriamycin cyclophosphate. S stands for taxane group of drugs. Example like paclitaxel group of drugs. 
right so these are the regimes that can be used in breast cancer now for hormonal therapy what are you going to use remember the drug of choice in premenopausal females the drug of choice in premenopausal female it is going to be tamoxifen that is selective estrogen receptor modulator if i ask you what is the drug of choice in post menopausal female in a post menopausal female then the answer is going to be aromatase inhibitors then the answer is going to be the aromatase inhibitors so when we say aromatase inhibitors in the aromatase inhibitors we have letrozole we have anastrozole and we have exmistan this is your previous exam question remember letrozole and anastrozole are non steroidal aromatase inhibitor exmistan is a steroidal aromatase inhibitor as a part of hormonal therapy you can go with bilateral salfingo ophorectomy bilateral salfingo ophorectomy can be performed right see manoj the most common cancer female worldwide right now it is lungs india also it is lungs everywhere it is lungs okay no confusion at all <clears throat> uh when you talk about radiotherapy we have two components number one is called as whole breast irradiation wbi another one is called as accelerated partial breast irradiation one is called as the whole breast irradiation another one is called as accelerated partial breast irradiation another one is your accelerated partial breast irradiation that is your apbi right so what is the difference that you see between these two now when we say the whole breast irradiation it is given to the entire chest wall it is given to the entire we give it to the entire chest wall we give it to the internal mammary group of lymph nodes we call as imln that is internal mammary group of lymph nodes supra clavicular fossa we give it to the supra clavicular fossa infra clavicular fossa we give it to the supra clavicular fossa we give it to the infra clavicular fossa we go to the chest wall the internal mammary group of lymph nodes the supra clavicular infra clavicular fossa in apbi we will only give it to the tumor cavity uh, the radiotherapy is given to the tumor cavity and to the adjacent tissue that's it We'll give it to the tumor cavity and the adjacent tissue. Nothing more than that, right? When it comes down to the radiation exposure, right? We'll give this for twenty-five days. We'll give one sitting per day with a total radiation exposure of fifty to fifty-five gray units, right? Here we'll only give it for five days. We'll be doing two sittings a day and a total radiation exposure of thirty to thirty-five gray units. A total radiation exposure of thirty to thirty-five gray units, right? Okay. So that is with respect to radio therapy. Clear? Chal. Uh, in terms of receptor status, uh, we have the following criteria. We have the luminal A, B, the basis and arterial type. luminal a er pr positive heart rate negative luminal b all three of them are positive it is called as triple positive basal three all three negative it is called as triple negative we call this as the triple positive breast cancer this is luminal b is termed as triple positive breast cancer it is termed as it is termed as triple positive breast cancer and the basal cell type is triple negative breast cancer her to neo type her to neo gene these two are negative and this is positive remember whenever her to neo gene is positive you can give the first line drug as trastuzumab uh, the marketed name for trastuzumab is herceptin 
it is harpsactin right uh, the second line drug that you have in terms of trastuzumab is going to be see if the trastuzumab is not working if it is not you know uh, tailored down if the patient is not been responding across with the trastuzumab the next drug that you can give a second line drug is your lapatinib if lapatinib is also resistant as a third line drug you can give as sunitinib right so these are the drugs that are given across here right so this is with respect to the components right in the breast surgeries uh, for benign breast disorders we have two incisions webster and the gilaro Webster's is also called as the circum areolar incision. It is called as the circum areolar incision. The galliaro is infra mammary incision. For breast cancer, we have the steward and the or incision. Steward is horizontally elliptical. Whereas OR is O for OR, O for oblique, it is obliquely elliptical. It is obliquely elliptical incision. So it's horizontally elliptical and the obliquely elliptical incision. Now in simple mastectomy, what are the components that you're going to remove? We are going to remove the entire glandular part of the breast. We are going to remove the entire stromal component of the breast along with the nipple areolar complex. In radical mastectomy, we will do simple mastectomy. We will remove the pectoralis major muscle. We will remove the pectoralis minor muscle. Along with that, we will remove level 1, level 2 and level 3 group of lymph nodes. And this is what we call as radical mastectomy, also called as the Halstead's mastectomy. It is also called as the Halstead's mastectomy, right? On the other hand, we have modified radical mastectomy. In modified radical mastectomy, we will be doing simple mastectomy. I will only remove the pectoralis fascia, not the muscle, but I will be removing level 1, level 2 and level 3 group of lymph nodes. There are three varieties, the patty skin lens and the Auchin claws. The most commonly performed is Auchin claws. In patties, this muscle that we are talking about is the pectoralis minor muscle. Now, when you look at the pectoralis minor muscle, if you excise, it is patties. If you incise, it is canines. If you retract, it is auchin claws. Remember in these two, level 1, level 2, level 3 group of lymph nodes are removed. In auchin claws, level 1 and level 2 are removed. Level 3 is spared. Level 3 is spared. Right. So these are the various breast surgeries that you should be remembering across. Now again two important components. What are the structures that are preserved and what are the complications of MRI? Structures that are preserved. A stands for axillary vein. B stands for Bell's nerve, also called as long thoracic nerve. C stands for cephalic vein. And D stands for nerve to latissimus dorsi. D stands for dorsi. The complications associated with the modified radical mastectomy can be remembered as swab. S stands for seroma formation, which is the most common complication. W stands for winging of scapula. The winging of scapula. A stands for your axillary vein thrombosis. Axillary vein thrombosis and development of arm edema. D stands for black. Sorry, swab. B stands for black. Black basically means flap necrosis. It means flap necrosis. Okay. So simple way to remember. These are your previous exam questions. Structures that should be preserved in MRM. And the complications associated with modified radical mastectomy.
Is that clear guys? So far any questions? Quick feedback. Any questions? Anything that you want to ask in terms of breast? Anything that you want to ask in terms of breast? Quick feedback. Quick feedback. Quick feedback. Anybody? No questions, right? All right, so, uh, okay. So before we conclude uh, for today's session, I will take few images that are going to be important from the surgery relevance. Take, we'll see if you're able to identify and then we'll move across from there, right? So what is this drain? Anybody, what is this drain? Drain, 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 drain. What drain is this? This is what we call it as, when you see the color is orange, so it has to be rubber or also <coughs> sorry okay uh, also called as latex right this is rubber or latex corrugated drain these are the dependent drains right so th these are called as the dependent drain these are the dependent drains they drain only because of gravity or the dependent status right when you see if it is white in color transparent with a green strip which is actually a radio opaque strip uh, this is what we call it as the silicon based corrugated drain now i will always prefer silicon because silicon is biologically inert it is biologically inert, so I'll be preferring the silicon tree. This is what we call it as a standard Foley's catheter. Tomorrow we'll also talk about the color codes and the usage of Foley's catheter, right? So this is your Foley's catheter. Now, when you come down here, you see this is what we call it as T-tube. T-tube is used when you are doing a CBD exploration. Everybody knows it, right? It's a CBD exploration. We are going to put it at T-tube. This is what we call it as the Romovac suction drain. This is what we call it as the Romovac suction drain. This is also called as a closed drain system which works on negative pressure or a suction pressure. It works on a negative or a suction pressure, right? What is this drain? This is what we call it as the pen rose drain. We don't use it those often, but these were the drains which are used around a bowel, especially when you're doing an esophageal surgery. So this is your pen rose drain. Right, so these are the first set of drains that you remember. Now, next one. This is what we call it as the three-way Foley's catheter. Now, we are going to use a three-way Foley's catheter whenever we require bladder irrigation. Now, bladder irrigation can be given after a bladder injury or if there is a bladder tumor of your done a top. For all these, you have to give bladder irrigation. Now you see there are one, two and three and three, you know, tubes that are present in three-way Foley's catheter, right? The one which is color coded, it is to inflate the balloon. This is to inflate the Foley's catheter balloon. Out of these three, whichever is the largest, I can see the second one is the largest or the biggest in diameter. This is for urine collection. And the third one is used for irrigation. Whichever is a bigger tube, that is where you have to collect the urine from. And the smaller tube will be used for bladder irrigation. It will be used for bladder irrigation, right? This is what we call it as the nasogastric tube, NGT tube, commonly referred to as the Riles tube, right? Now you can see it is transparent, lined with green color. Green is your radio opaque. Transparent means it is silicon. Now, how do you assess the length of the Riles tube or the nasogastric tube? We have a standard rule, which is what we call it as the next rule, right? Now, what do you mean by the next rule? So if you take this as a representation, 
of the patient right if you take this as the representation of the patient and this is the presentation that you have right so in order to measure the length of the rhyl's tube from the tip of the nose to the ear lobe from the ear lobe when you look across here this is where we'll say the sternal status is present right so let's say if this is the sternum that you're talking about and this is the ziphy sternum right so from the ear lobe to the tip of the ziphy sternum it is called as nose ear lobe and ziphy sternum simply called as the next rule this is how you will measure the length of the nasogastric tube okay it is the nasogastric tube now when you look across here this is what we call it as the jackson pratt dream this is what we call it as the jackson pratt drain again this works same as your romovac drain so it is also an example of a closed suction drain it works on negative pressure also called as the suction drain or the negative pressure drain right now <clears throat> this is what we call it as the syngaskin blake motu it is the syngaskin blake mor tube now this sbt or the syngaskin blake mor tube it is used for bleeding esophageal varices it is used for bleeding esophageal varices right now you can see there are two balloons in this this is what we call it as the gastric balloon and this is what we call it as the esophageal balloon now remember in order to inflate in both the balloons you should only put air not the fluid now when you talk about the gastric balloon how much air you should put it i am going to pump 300 ml of air esophageal balloon i am not worried about the quantity i am worried about the pressure i'll pump it to 40 mm mercury pressure a 40 mm mercury pressure is what we are going to rely on this right so this is with respect to syngaskin blake motu this is what we call it as the pig tail catheter now this pig tail catheter is usually used to drain any collection which is viscous and especially if it is there in the pelvis or in the solid organ status right so these are the various drains that they can ask you from the exam perspective clear so now another uh, question that they'll ask you in terms of exam is the color code of the cannula and their flow rate now the color that you can see in the first one this is your orange color cannula which is a 14 gauge needle with a flow rate of 240 ml per minute it is 240 ml per minute the second one that you have is a gray cannula which is a 16 gauge at a flow rate of 180 ml per minute one that you'll see more often in your casualty is going to be green which is an 18 gauge cannula with a flow rate of 90 ml per minute then you have the pink cannula which is actually at a 20 gauge at a flow rate of 60 ml per minute then you have the blue cannula which is at 22 gauge at 35 ml per minute for pediatric you have the yellow cannula with a 24 gauge needle at 20 ml per minute at a flow rate and the last one that you have is a violet or a purple color cannula which is a 26 gauge needle at a flow rate of 12 ml per minute at a flow rate of 12 ml per minute right so these are all the color codes and the relevant flow rates that you need to know i know it looks a lot of information for us to understand remember recall but i have a very easy way to understand and remember this right so when you go down right what is the core of the earth the core of the earth is made up of lava the lava is orange in color above the lava what do you have 
above the lava you have this soil the soil is going to be gray in color right now above the soil what do you have right you have this green trees that are going to go across right on top of this green trees what do you have you have this beautiful pink flowers that are present right on top of pink flower what do you have right you have this nice beautiful blue sky right what do you have in this blue sky in the blue sky you have the sun which is very very important for us right above the sun what do you have right obviously you have the universe so just to get your perspective i'm just giving the universe in purple color right uh, if you don't believe that this is universe i can convince you by putting small small dots and i will say that these are the stars that are present right so this is the universe that you have the stars right so these are the color codes right so uh, in the screen it looks like black because we're using a green screen to project it so i'm sorry that it does not look green but it is actually green right so when you look across here this is 14 gauge this is 16 gauge this is your green which is going to be 18 gauge this is 20 gauge 22 gauge sun there is there 24 7 so 24 gauge this is your 26 gauge this is going to be 26 gauge right so this is how you're going to remember the angular size now the question that is asked is what is the ideal size of cannula in trauma resuscitation? In trauma resuscitation, the ideal size that has to be taken is at 16 gauge. Now, when I say what is the minimum size in trauma resuscitation? For trauma resuscitation, the minimum size will be 18 gauge. So, do not goof up between the ideal size and the minimum size that are responsible or required now another very important is what is the fluid of choice for trauma resuscitation fluid of choice in trauma resuscitation fluid of choice in trauma resuscitation is ringer lactate preferred over normal saline that you have to remember preferred over normal saline that you have to remember if i change the same fluid of choice for burns patient or fluid resuscitation burns again it is going to be ringer lactate again it is going to be ringer lactate clear so this is in terms of cannula size as well as the resuscitative protocols right now Again, a very important topic that you have nowadays is laparoscopy. We have the instruments, right? So let's understand what is the difference. Uh, this shallow part is what we call it as port. The solid tube is what we call it as trocar. If you have a bigger port, we'll call it as a 10 mm port. A smaller one is what we call it as a 5 mm port in a trocar, right? This is what we call it as the lens to which we are going to attach the camera. The standard angle at which we are going to use, it is going to be a 30 degree lens. It is going to be a 30 degree lens that we commonly use. Normally, when you look at the trocars no, or the port, you will see they are very sharp. You can see this is going to be sharp. These are also going to be sharp. But when you look across here, there is something special about it. It is blunt. And this is what we call it as a blunt trocar. A blunt trocar, whenever you use it, this is what we call it as the atraumatic trocar. This is what we call it as an atraumatic trocar. And it is commonly known as the Hansen's port. This is commonly referred to as the Hansen's port. Right? Now, when you look at the other image, this is what we call it as the varies needle and this has been your previous exam question so when you look at the varies needle couple of important questions that you should be able to answer uh, what is the purpose of varies needle right why do you have varies needle or what 
or why are you using a Veris needle, right? So when you look at the Veris needle, the sole purpose of Veris needle, it is to create nemoperitoneum. This is to create nemoperitoneum. So when you talk about nemoperitoneum, three important questions that I can think about in the exam. Number one, what is the most common gas used to create nemoperitoneum? The answer is carbon dioxide. When you're putting the carbon dioxide, what is the initial flow rate? The initial flow rate is going to be one to four liters per minute, right? On the other hand, what is the maximum flow rate that you can keep? It is going to be 20 liters per minute. On the other hand, I'm saying per minute, sorry, one to four liters, yeah, per minute. Right. On the other hand, what should be ideal intra-abdominal pressure during laparoscopy? It should be 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. It is going to be 12 to 50 millimeters of mercury when you create nemoperitoneum. Right. Now, uh, in terms of very needle, uh, again an important aspect. Uh, if there is an iatrogenic injury with very needle, if there is a, if there is an iatrogenic injury, if there is an iatrogenic injury with very needle, where a patient has a bowel injury or a vascular injury, what will you do? Remember immediately stop carbon dioxide insufflation that means stop the gas that you're pumping second convert into laparotomy convert to laparotomy but most importantly keep the various needle in c2 keep the needle in c2 uh, another question that they can ask you about very needle. What is the angle between the needle and the skin while entry? Now, this was your exam question. Remember, anywhere the angle between the needle and the skin at the entry point is going to be 90 degrees. It is going to be 90 degrees. Clear? All right. So. This is what we call it as SILS. SILS stands for single incision. It stands for single incision laparoscopic. Single incision laparoscopic port surgery. It is your single incision laparoscopic port surgery. That is what we call it as SILS. Okay. The angle between the varies needle and the body uh, okay, is a, a small twist in the tail. When if it is between the very needle and the skin, it is ninety. Very needle in the body, it is forty-five degrees. Very needle, whenever you insert it, is always pointed towards the pelvis, not towards the zephy sternum. Most common gas used is carbon dioxide. Initial flow rate is one to four liters per minute that we are going to use. Maximum flow rate that we are going to keep across here. The maximum flow rate. Is going to be 20 liters per minute. It is going to be 20 liters per minute. Uh, the intra abdominal pressure is going to be 12 to 15 millimeters of mercury. We have already answered the accidental post placement injury, convert to laparotomy, stop insufflation, keep the instrument or needle in C2. That is what you have to remember, right? Now, these are the ideal angles that you have to maintain while doing laparoscopy. I've given us one, two, three. I'll explain you what is this. Now, if you take this as the representation of the patient's abdomen, right? One second, guys. Okay. You take this as the representation of the patient's abdomen, right? This is the umbilicus, right? Uh, let's say I am putting three different ports. Okay, give me a second.
Okay, one second. Okay, so let's say we put the first instrument or the first access point that you will take. We'll call this as the optical axis. Now, the optical axis is the one through which you're putting the camera, right? Then I will be putting two more instruments for me to work. I'll call it as working port number one. Another one is the working port number two. This is the standard laparoscopic placement. Now, in order to maintain the ergonomics, right, so that you'll be able to work without interfering with each other instrument while <coughs> you are in the abdomen, you have to follow certain rules, right? Now, the first one is what we call it as the elevating angle. It is the angle between any instrument and the body. If I take this as the body plane, right, the angle between the instrument and the body, or if I just take an access point anywhere, if I just draw the line here from the body, again, the same, right? The angle between the body and the instrument is what we call it as the elevating angle. And ideally an elevating angle should be 60 degrees, right? Angle between an optical axis, angle between an optical axis and a working port, this is what we call it as the azimuth angle. This is what we call it as azimuth angle. The angle between the two working ports, the angle between the two working ports, this is what we call it as the manipulating angle. This is what we call it as the manipulating angle. The angle between the two working ports is what we call it as the manipulating angle. Again, azimuth angle is at 30 degrees and the manipulating angle is at 60 degrees. These are the ideal angles to maintain the ergonomics of laparoscopy. To maintain the ergonomics of laparoscopy. Is that clear? Okay. So if you look across here, the angle number three that you have mentioned here is the elevating angle. The angle number one that we have maintained here is what we call it as the manipulating angle. The azimuth angle is the angle number two. Right. So angle number two is azimuth. Angle number one is manipulating. Angle number three is the elevating angle. Is that clear? <laughs> So these are the energy devices that you have monopolar you have a single pole bipolar you have two poles this is a harmonic scalpel and this is a combined energy source that is your thunder beat right now remember uh, in the uh, monopolar and bipolar you have two things that you need to understand that what is a cut current and what is a coagulation mode. Now to understand the cut and the coagulation current, we'll always chart the graph between two components. We'll take this as the y axis. This will take as the x axis. In the y axis, I will say the voltage. In the x axis, we'll maintain the frequency. Whenever you're using a cut current, remember it should have a low voltage but very high frequency so that it can cut through the tissue. It should be like running. On the other hand, in order to coagulate a tissue but not cut, again when you plot the graph on y axis it is voltage, x axis it is frequency, you will notice that you will have high voltage but low frequency. You will have high voltage and low frequency. This is your coagulation current. So cut will be low voltage. Cut current will have low voltage, but it will be associated with high frequency. Right? Coagulation will have low frequency, but it will have high voltage. It will have high voltage. Now, there is something called as a blend mode. It's a combination of these two where you have an average frequency and an average. So you'll have the voltage is not that high, but the frequency is also not that low. So if it is between 
cut and coagulate this is what we call it as the blend mode this is what we call it as the blend mode right harmonic scalpel or the harmonic cutter that you have it works on vibrating frequency right so it vibrates between 20000 to 50000 hertz now with this much amount of vibrating frequency it is going to cause protein denaturation now this protein denaturation is due to vibrating energy or i can say it is due to vibrating friction it is due to the vibrating energy causing friction a very very important point harmonic scalpel is the one which is safe in patients with the pacemaker because it will not have any electrical discharge it will not interfere with pacemaker monopolar and bipolar can interfere with pacemakers okay whereas the combined energy source is of both electrical it will use electrical energy as well as it will be using the vibrating energy as well it will use both the energy sources it will use both electrical as well as vibrating energy sources hence this is going to be your combined energy source clear guys <clears throat> so this is how you're going to remember your energy devices right so far so good quick feedback koi shak koi sawal sir in uh, breast cancer how to remember staging it's important to remember See Manoj, the only cancer that you have to remember in terms of TNM classification and staging is breast. Everywhere else you'll remember only the TNM classification. Breast may remember karna thoda mushkil hai, but if you practice once or twice, it's not that difficult. Okay. Alright, so uh, let's do it this way. I'm going to call the session off here today. So this will be the end of part one. Tomorrow it will be all systemic surgery, right? Today we try to cover trauma and general surgery as, as a uniform clot. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, if you have any questions, you can keep posting on uh, the chat section here or the comment section. I'll go through the questions tomorrow. I'll try to address it as well. Uh, we'll have a lot of interaction tomorrow as well. Tomorrow we'll also discuss about few important strategies that you need to build up for your exam and also surgery as a subject right so you need to have a great respect great passion for whatever you do and whatever you do with that passion it will always flourish right so uh with that node let's end the session here today uh thank you for listening so patiently hope i was being able to contribute a bit to your preparation and looking forward to much much more many sessions right so signing off guys, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. We'll see you guys again tomorrow, right? Uh, see, somebody is asking trocar and port. Uh, see, normally you have two components. One is the hollow component that you have. In a hollow component, you will see which will be present like this. Uh, for that, you have to watch down my videos where I have shown you the real trocars and the port. This is the trocar you have seen. This is the port where it is hollow, right? Uh, you will have a rubber cap which is present on top of it. So this is going to be holding this from leaking out. Uh, there are these channels through which you can put irrigation, vent, and then you can also put gas. This is hollow. This is what we call it as port. Trocar on the other hand, it is like a solid cylinder. It is a metallic cylinder which is going to be like this absolutely solid it is absolutely solid absolutely blunt and this is what we call it as trocar right this is what we call it as trocar so normally what we do is we see uh, when you're putting this 
in the abdomen no? if you are only using port port is hollow no when you try to push into the abdomen it can you know because it is hollow if you exert more force it can bend it can deform it can compress it it loses its visibility its integrity right and the port can get damaged it's very expensive so what we do is we take this as a trocar right trocar is solid port is hollow we put the trocar inside the port trocar inside the port it gives you that strength now i am using the tip of the trocar which is pointy to pierce through the abdominal wall and place the port along with the trocar into the abdominal wall once the port is placed i remove the trocar out now this provides me access to put my instruments take in take out put my lens take in take out i'll be able to operate and this is how you understand port and trocar yeah Okay. So I hope uh, I was able to address your query as well. With that, signing off. Thank you. Good night. See you guys again.